Um, yes, I. It is my great pleasure to introduce our next speaker today, Dr. Isabel Lavelle. Um, Dr. Lavelle is joining us from Tokyo, I think, where she is currently working as assistant professor in Japanese literature at Nihon University. Um, there, she teaches Japanese literature in English. Uh, with a focus on translation, transcultural exchanges, and word literature. A couple of words on her background. Uh, after studying French literature in Paris at the famous Sorbonne University, she then earned, earned two PhDs in Japanese studies from Paris Diderot in 2016 and in communication studies from Waseda in Tokyo in 2018. Um, as a researcher, she focuses on the reception, integration, and transformation of European texts into Japanese literature, focusing particularly uh, on the period between the late 19th and early 20th century, I think. So between the end of the Meiji and the Taisho period. Her current research analyzing in, uh, analyzes in particular the reception of French uh, exoticism and literary Japanese in early 20th century Japan. And perhaps this would be in part, at least, the topic of today's presentation. I don't know. Uh, incidentally, I'm also happy to see that with her presentation, um, we will add yet one more approach to our discussion, since in her abstract, she mentions the notion of translation scape. So I think we can assume that or we can expect that uh, there will be some insight from translation studies, which I look forward to. Um, her paper today is called is titled From Chanson to Uta, The Canonization of French Symbolist Poetry in, in Early 20th Century Japan. So Dr. Laval, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea, for this kind presentation. I will uh, share the screen now. Okay. So yes, uh, as you can see in the title here today, I'd like to approach this idea of canonization and canon. And it is, as Eduardo mentioned, um, a concept that necessarily needs to be addressed when we're talking about textual heritage and that we haven't yet completely uh, discussed in this symposium. And for me, the difference between canon and heritage, as far as I understand it, is that um, canon or canonization implies a much more top-down approach, an institutionalized approach to text, texts that have been institutionalized as high literature, especially in the case of the text I'm going to talk about today, the French symbolist uh, poetry. So um, I guess one of my question today and in general when I talk about this text is what do we do today in the 21st century with this canonized text or this canonical text, this canon that used to be presented as uh, models for what literature should be. Again, with this very top-down approach uh, taught in university, for instance, in academia, as a model for um, what poetry should be. And um, today, this approach, of course, and rightfully so, is very much put into question. So these texts um, are very much often written by the proverbial dead white man. So they uh, carry with them their load of uh, issues and problems. And this is how I would like to start this presentation. I think these uh, paradigms uh, have been uh, discussed in this uh, symposium so far, especially by Professor Deneke in her uh, keynote speech, this idea of high culture and top-down canonization, and maybe heritage, this notion of heritage can come as a pendant to this, something that uh, focuses more, as we said before in uh, previous presentations, on a participatory approach, so people really are getting involved on a more intimate level with the text, rather than being taught or being told these texts, you should read them and you should uh, appreciate or at least admire them. So maybe textual heritage in this sense could be a way to redeem the canonical or the canon of uh, 19th century literature uh, by bringing in more uh, proximity, intimacy, uh, dialogue, as we said, to um, address these issues, which are very much at, heart, at the heart of this canonical text. So here I, I, in this, on this slide, I mentioned just a couple of these issues. And I think mentioning these issues with, uh, as a 
as attached to symbolism is not to say we need to criticize symbolism or symbolism is problematic, is to really uh, put back um, really uh, relevance within this idea of symbolism, which otherwise could end up just being um, a disembodied text that is only uh, taught in universities or for a very uh, narrow elite. So I think uh, this idea, especially of um, that we already mentioned of uh, race and gender, these two um, concepts already popped up in previous discussions, uh, have to be addressed when it comes to symbolism, not again to uh, morally condemn sim symbolism, but to show that they are at the heart of, at the heart of um, uh, uh, problems that were that are very relevant today and were addressed albeit very often indirectly by these texts. So here, for instance, uh, this question of miso misogynism and Eurocentricism, which is especially relevant in uh, the field of world literature, uh, is embodied, for instance, if we think about Charles Baudelaire, who is really the father figure of French symbolism uh, through the person of Jeanne Duval, whose portrait you can see on the bottom left. Uh, this is a portrait by Baudelaire. Jeanne Duval was this uh, black woman who's, who Baudelaire uh, had a relationship with. Um, and she is very much fetishized for her race and object, objectified for her gender in Les Fleurs du Mal. So this needs to be taken into account as well as this idea of Eurocentricism. And in this case of symbolism, we could say maybe French centricism. Uh, this is why here I put Pascal Casanova's uh, seminal work in world literature, the World Republic of Letters with this place that France uh, takes, uh, which needs to be, I think, addressed more and more problematized in the field of world literature. I also put here an extract from uh, a manga uh, told called Akunohana, Flowers of Evil, Les Fleurs du Mal, in the um, title of, of course, uh, Baudelaire's famous uh, poetry book. And you can see here in this manga uh, that these two young characters, when they're discussing this book, the female character here has not read uh, or hasn't even heard about this book before, and she feels shame at the end, right? Uh, for not knowing about this book. I felt uh, as though I'd been an ignorant fool my whole life. So I put this here because I thought it embodied quite well what this uh, idea of canon does to us and especially to young students who are uh, supposedly being introduced to this, we could call it literature with a capital L. And um, so I'd like to address this question in this um, presentation and maybe ask, what to do with this canon in the 21st century? Should it be saved? Should we still uh, talk about it? Is it still relevant? And can this idea of textual heritage actually in some way save or redeem these canonical uh, Eurocentric misogynistic texts and elitist also, as I will address uh, more later. So just as an aside, as we're talking about heritage and heritageization in this uh, symposium, right now, the, po the poet I would like to address today, especially uh, Verlaine and his famous lover uh, Rimbaud, are very much at the heart of a controversy around heritage and cultural heritage in, in France. So here I put some uh, English language media reporting on this, uh, the very French fight. <laughs> around this issue. So the question is whether to move their ashes into the Pantheon, which is this place where the French Republic heroes are supposed to uh, be enshrined, right? So they haven't been so far and they are not in the Pantheon yet uh, because as, we, uh, as I was saying, this canonization process that symbolism went through erases uh, to some extent the uh, shock, shock factor, the scandalous factor that was associated with this movement in the 19th century, and which is today, in a way, put forward in order to say, look, these texts are not boring, these texts are not part, uh, past, part of the past, these people were, were rebels, and of course, there's a whole interesting new outlook on Verlaine and Rimbaud from the queer studies perspective. So this is an ongoing debate in France. Uh, which also asks the question about this heritization of uh, recuperation by government and authorities of uh, 
text and textual heritage? Uh, to what extent does a government want to capitalize on, an, on the aura of these uh, famous authors, right? So uh, today I would like to address Paul Verlaine, especially uh, from the perspective of his uh, translation in Japanese. And for me, especially as a Japanese uh, studies scholar, another way of redeeming or saving this French canonical text is to decentralize uh, or displace them from France to in my case, Japan, but it could be to other languages and especially non-European languages by displacing the locus of uh, their relevance. Uh, you can see different uh, aspects of these texts and how uh, they became relevant in different ways within different contexts. So here today I'm talking about Ueda Bing who is a um, central figure in the introduction and translation of uh, symbolist uh, poetry in Japan, but as you can see here, I just um, wrote a couple of his main texts uh, and essays. He's really at the heart of uh, this huge work uh, done by many uh, Japanese author translators during the Meiji era of introducing uh, major European texts. He starts with uh, Walter Pater and British aestheticism in general. You have also with that being to credit for the introduction of uh, Wismans and decadent literature in general into Japanese. Paul Verlaine, I believe, this text uh, published in Tekokubungaku, the fa famous literary journal in 1896, is actually the first one to really mention Verlaine in Japanese. And it was published on the occasion of Verlaine's death in France to uh, celebrate this poet and introduce him into Japanese uh, context. And it's also with, with this uh, Paul Verlaine uh, essay that the first occurrence of the word symbolist seems to be appearing within the Japanese language. Another reason I focus on Ueda Bing today is because to my knowledge, he is really the first Japanese author translator to explicitly put himself within the lineage, lineage the conceptual lineage of world literature, which obviously uh, borrows to Goethe. And you can see here this extract in 1890. This is one of the very first essays of Ueda Bing when you can see he was still very young uh, as he was born in 1874. Um, and he uh, presents himself as a champion of world literature and what this concept can do to uh, Japanese literature. And for me, this is again another way of uh, looking at uh, this, of displacing the debate from Europe to Japan is not only looking at the way these texts were translated and adapted and uh, re uh, received within the Japanese context and by Japanese uh, readers, but also to look at the theory used by these Japanese authors, translators, um, how they conceived of literature with using concept coming from Europe or not, but how these concepts also traveled and were used maybe in different ways than in Europe. And this I think is a, a research that has not been done yet concerning, for instance, the way the concept of world literature has been used in Meiji Japan. So this idea of uh, Ueda being, being at the heart of a movement in favor of Japanese literature joining world literature means also a very specific approach to translation. And indeed, as Eduardo mentioned, um, or maybe it was Andrea, sorry. Today, I'd like to talk about the role of translation. And one of my questions, and I would like to hear uh, all of your insights about this is whether a translated text can be a textual heritage. For instance, my question is this famous poem by Verlaine, which I would like to discuss today. It's a French poem. Can it be part of a Japanese textual heritage? My question, as you might guess, is very much yes. But this implies a very specific approach to um, translation. So as you can see here, for instance, in this extract, and I will come back to other quotes by Ueda Bing, uh, Bing has a very specific uh, view on translation. Translation is not at the service of the source text. Uh, it has to be 
a, a translated text has to be a text that has its own legitimacy, its own autonomy that stands on its own. And so his focus is very much on the target language here, which is of course the Japanese language um, and how these texts can fully be incorporated within Japanese language literature. So in a way, the fact that it comes from French is nearly secondary. So um, this uh, poem uh, that I would like to <laughs> finally come to, it has been included within this famous anthology or collection of translated poems, Kai Chong, Sounds of the Tide, published in 1905, because in the article I mentioned previously, uh, Paul Verlaine in 1896, where Deding only introduces Verlaine and uh, mentions that he's a symbolist, etc. But he does not necessarily uh, pro uh, provide any translation. So he um, publishes in 1905 this very famous and influential collection of translated poems called uh, Kai Chong. And here I will uh, maybe come back a little bit onto this later, but I'd like to draw your attention to the title of this collection, Sounds of the Tide, right? The tide being, of course, uh, this metaphorical ocean bringing all of these foreign texts to the shore of Japan, but uh, the emphasis is on the sounds, uh, on not the concept, not the text, but the sounds that these, uh, this tide, this foreign tide is bringing to, to the Japanese language. So finally, here we are with this famous poem, uh, Chanson d'automne. This poem is extremely famous within the French language and within the Japanese language. I'm not really certain actually of its status within English, the English language, whether it's familiar with most English speakers or not, I guess it's not. Uh, but here I provided the translation by Arthur Simmons, which is in itself very influential. I will go back to this a little bit uh, later on. Um, so here I will focus on the first two stanzas in French, the first lines, uh, which have been really canonized. Uh, within French literature, and I will explain why a little bit later on, and also uh, within the Japanese context. So, uh, les sanglots longs des violons de l'automne blessent mon cœur d'une longueur monotone. What uh, is striking here is already the, the very short meter used in this poetry, which put the emphasis on the recurring uh, rhyme. And uh, if you look at the translation, by the way, being, there's something very interesting happening here. Uh, you can see here that he uses the five uh, syllable meter, so or meter, so he uh, stays very faithful to a meter that is extremely familiar, obviously, for the uh, Japanese readers. Uh, but alongside this, he um, brings in an innovation which is a tentative to recreate, recreate a rhyme within the Japanese uh, prosody, right? Which is uh, not part of the traditional way of approaching poetry in Japan. So, aki no hino, violon no tamen kino. And there, there are many debates, including uh, at the time that Bing was writing and still today, whether Japanese language uh, can actually produce rhymes. Uh, I'm not going to go too much into this. Uh, technical uh, details, uh, but here the challenge, at least, has been um, uh, been actually uh, uh, certainly tried to arise to the challenge of recreating the French rhyme. So I will go back a little bit later on to this uh, the musicality of this poem and uh, why it matters. But before that, um, I wanted to look at uh, whether this poem in Japanese and these first lines in particular can be or cannot be uh, thought of as textual heritage. So as uh, for instance, um, Professor um, uh, Harvey discussed uh, yesterday during his presentation, I think textual heritage, uh, it needs to be thought of as a dialogue between many different uh, types of texts, married many different uh, media, married many different readerships, many different also register of uh, literature, so high literature, uh, popular literature. So I tried to look a little bit at 
um, the way this line is still used and alive today, especially in the field of popular literature and, for instance, manga. Um, so here you have uh, one of the most uh, famous usage of this line in the title of books. And this is not the only book in Japanese published in the 20th century, which has this first line as its title, Aki no Hino Vieron no Tame Kino. Here you have uh, this book by Morioko, who is probably not famous today anymore, but used to be a popular uh, writer of romances and entertainment uh, fiction in the 80s. And here you can see, well, this is a romance novel, so it would be part of the category of popular literature um, in Japan, Taishu Bungaku. And uh, you can see really well how boring this uh, first line that belong, that is, has been canonized as part of high literature or jun, uh, Bungaku in Japan uh, can work in favor of uh, this book and in favor of targeting a very specific uh, readership. So more specifically, for instance, the kind of middle class female readership who would be interested in romance novel, but also uh, taking French lessons and learning the piano, this kind of uh, readers come to mind when you see this kind of title. So uh, this is another aspect that we need to think of when we think of textual heritage and canon is this dichotomy between high and low literature. And these two categories are extremely uh, seems enshrined within Japanese literature, especially since the 1930s. And this the creation, for instance, of these two specific literary prizes, Akutagawa for Jun literature, Naoki Sho for popular literature. But actually what we see is that they function in a constant uh, dialogue, validating each other. So the categorical uh, boundaries here are actually extremely porous and exist only in order to validate each other, uh, I feel. Um, so, you can see here in the manga extract I put that it is used to emphasize the, um, the foreign aspect of this uh, text because the French text is also present, also the difficult aspect of it, you can, if you can see that the, the, the face of the female character at the bottom. And in manga you can see many occurrences of these lines being quoted in order to often create a somehow comical effect by emphasizing its high literature status and sometimes it's um, the difficult access, access, the accessibility that is a little bit uh, hindered by this status, but still somehow it exists and uh, ring a bell within uh, these characters. So here you have example for those of you who speak Japanese, the line is quoted. And then the question is, uh, so what is a violon? Because obviously here, um, the loan word violon is borrowed from the French violon rather than the English violin. So violin would be the contemporary of uh, talking about the violin in, the violin in Japanese today. And, but this uh, focus on violon is really di directly a quote to the translation of Ueda being who keep the French uh, loan, loan word rather than the English one. Uh, another example here in the same manga of this, the misunderstanding that can arise uh, from the metaphorical language of poetry as we're talking about a violin that is sighing or in other translation that could be uh, crying and the characters find this extremely uh, disturbing uh, violin uh, taking life on its own uh, in a way. So I think here it creates this uh, incomprehension, comical effect, but still uh, this line is something that some characters uh, stick to as a little bit of a trademark for their quirk, the quirk, or maybe uh, a trademark for their social status or their cultured uh, uh, personality that is supposedly different than, from others. Uh, this is one of the issues I have with reception studies, especially if, if we look at the very rich and really wide world of manga. Um, there are so many works and so many different readership and so many different versions of the same work that it's, it's kind of difficult to really use this kind of extracts in a scientific way without uh, being accused of cherry picking. Um, so I would like also to hear from um, some of you, if you have uh, ideas about this, how to really 
evaluate the reception of these texts. If we're talking about textual heritage, how do we really know whether a text is part of heritage or not? How do we evaluate that? Uh, how much data is enough data? For instance, in manga, this line is being quoted. What does it really mean for the Japanese um, language readership today? Do they know this line? Uh, do, does it really ring a bell? So another way of looking at this, uh, whether this line is part of the Japanese uh, general representation of what poetry is or what culture is, um, is through these uh, other quotes. This seems similar to the ones before, but you can see here a different theme emerging, which is a militaristic one. So you can see here again a manga where, I don't know if you can see, but on the top here you have the quote uh, from Baudelaire. Um, the same quotes so, or uh, violin aki no hino viuron no tame kino here and here another novel this is a popular novel more like a, a thriller a historical thriller uh, with the same title violin no tame kino and um, this actually alludes to Verlaine, but in a very indirect way. What they are alluding to is the fact that these lines in French were famously used by the BBC um, to, as a code to signal that the D-Day was imminent. So with the, for, towards the French resistance in France listening to the BBC, uh, people, the French resistance knew that when they would hear uh, Verlaine's lines, the D-Day would be imminent. So um, this is why if you type these lines, even in Japanese, you see many of these uh, reference to Second World War, to uh, militaristic actions. And um, yesterday in Professor Harvey's presentation, there were very interesting insights about the intersection of history with a uh, history, personal history and then history with a capital H. And I think here this moment, the D-Day and the fight against Nazism is really this uh, stereotypical mystified nar narrative of uh, glory and valor, including in Japan in sometimes an ambiguous way. Um, and the fact that Verlaine, uh, this line is involved here, somehow um, double the layers of what kind of heritage this text has become, right? It's, it's, it's part of this high elitist uh, culture that gives uh, some kind of uh, credential to the characters who quote and know them. But on the other hand, it's also part of this uh, much more masculine uh, militaristic history, history of glory as rewritten by the thinkers, of course, of the Second World War. Another usage that is co uh, conspicuous of this first line is if you look at advertisement for concert and quite uh, straightforwardly, especially concert happening in autumn uh, with a violinist <laughs> at the center of it. So you find these uh, advertisements, these pamphlets uh, advertising concerts using these Ver uh, Verlaine uh, lines uh, in very high numbers on online if you look at them. So here you have um, and again, just the loan word violon and not violin signal this uh, appartenance, this belonging to this tradition of Ueda Bing's translation. You have a, again here, akino hino violon no tame kino. So the whole first line in this case. Um, and here again, akino hino violon no tame kino, et cetera. Um, so here, this is a way for me to um, bring me to this aspect of music and musicality, which is supposed to be at the center of this poem. And uh, I wanted to emphasize this because I think for me, the, the reason this sentence, this line, aki no hino, violon no tame kino, refuses to die in a way and is still popping up here and there in different media, different contexts, different um, narratives in Japanese language is because of its high music quality, uh, which is actually a direct, um, in direct relation to uh, Verlaine's poetry and what Verlaine was trying to uh, do as a poet himself. So I'm not going to do, go too much in detail here, but if you look at uh, Verlaine's poetry, very early on, they were put into music by famous uh, composers such as Debussy or Gabriel Fauré, but also by uh, someone like Reynaldo Hahn, who is famous in literary studies for being 
friend or lover of uh, Marcel Proust. I'm not going to elaborate too much on this. Uh, but what Verlaine is famous for and why he's so much uh, remembered, and especially in the Japanese context, and I will come to that, is for his uh, affinity with music and the way he puts music at the center of his poet uh, poetic art. So Art Poetic uh, is this poem by Verlaine. Uh, the title, of course, Ars Poetica, uh, is, announces that it's a manifesto uh, where he uh, explains what his poetry is about. De la musique avant toute chose, meaning music above anything else. So this is the first line of his poem, uh, Ars Poetica. So it's very clear. And uh, he explicitly positioned himself within this line of uh, that I think starts, especially with the European poetry with romanticism of poets who want to uh, close the gap as much as possible between poetry, so linguistic uh, art and music. So what I mean here by Verlaine as a leader of the late 19th century questioning of haute pictura poesis, the idea that especially in France with the classical tradition um, starting in the 17th century and post Renaissance, you have this idea that poetry needs to be clear, uh, harmonious, uh, also uh, rational, logical, uh, that it has to respect ru the rules of prosody, etc. And uh, the model for poetry is painting. So ut pictura poesis is an idea from, of course, uh, the Greco-Roman tradition. But as we move toward the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, this is uh, put into question and the model for poetry becomes more and more music. And the idea that um, somehow a divorce should be operated between the signifier and the signified within the usage of language in poetry, right? The idea that poetry should try to strive to become in a way pure uh, signif uh, signifier and operate a divorce with the signified. So here uh, with Verlaine, this is where within the French poetry, this uh, new um, movement, this new conceptualization of poetry really starts. And you can see this in the way he uses constantly chanson or serenade uh, for the title of his poems. You also have this book, poetry book called Romance Sans Parole, Romances Without uh, Parole, so without any lyrics. So here he, he's really trying to equate his poetry to uh, music. Uh, to distance uh, himself with uh, the content, the logical or rational aspect that language uh, brings really, and to focus on the pure feelings and uh, sensation that the sounds of the language brings us. And you can see here in the second example I gave how he directly incorporates musical notation, do mi sol, for instance, here uh, within his poetry. And uh, what I would like especially to focus on here is the way he is especially famous for the disarticulation of the meter. And I've already mentioned it in the case of Chanson d'Automne. Uh, he uses a very unusual uh, meters within the French poetry, especially uh, this decasyllab meter. So uh, 10 syllable, but with the caesura at the hemistic meaning a uh, five, five rhythm, uh, which is very unusual within French poetry. So decasyllable uh, verses usually are used in epic poetry, which is absolutely not the case here for Verlaine first. And usually the um, caesura is, uh, creates a six, four uh, patterns. Six being a very um, familiar uh, meter within the French poetry as it is um, uh, half of the famous French verse, which is from 12th syllable, the Alexandrin. Well, I'm not gonna go too much into this technical aspect, but uh, here we have maybe one key to understand uh, how much Berlaine immediately resonated for someone like Oida Bing with his constant and uh, personal, really innovative use of this five, five rhythm. And this uh, five, five rhythms are actually more or less uh, inspired by Berlin from his uh, affection or affinity with pre-Renaissance uh, poetry. So medieval poetry, especially Pierre de, uh, François Villon, for instance, and all these um, poems that were themselves already called chansons. Um, 
Verlaine is part of these uh, poets who imagine that there used to be a golden age for poetry where music and poetry were, were one. And this is very much also the case for someone like Uri Debing who uh, calls his, um, who, for Uri Debing and the people um, influenced by him who uh, think of uh, Waka as uh, especially musical and touching directly to the soul as opposed to Kanshi uh, bringing this a logic and rational way it actually shouldn't be, right? So this golden age before the Kanshi, uh, it also exists in the uh, mindset of these uh, Japanese author translators, such as Weda Bing. So Weda Bing constantly when he presents Baudelaire, but also in his translation strategies, constantly emphasizes this uh, musical approach to prosody. He focuses nearly exclusively actually on this form of uh, symbolism. So the prosodic innovation of symbolism, as you can see here, he presents them as uh, vers libris. So uh, he emphasizes how they take liberty with uh, prosody and the meter, especially as I just mentioned. Um, and you can see here in Kai Chong, when he translates Chanson d'Automne, he adds this comment that uh, with Verlaine, French poetry borrowed the sounds of music. Um, so the sounds of music were incorporated within French poetry with, uh, with Verlaine. So you can uh, uh, see here with this emphasis on form over content. And also, this is a little bit of a different issue that I like to discuss here uh, of emphasis on Verlaine over someone like Baudelaire within symbolism, a very um, deliberate uh, uh, stance by Ueda being to emphasize this musical quality of symbolism over other uh, aspects associated with symbolism, such as a shocking contents, uh, for instance, uh, putting into poetry uh, death, uh, sex, uh, drugs, this uh, kind of thing that are associated very much with symbolism and Baudelaire in France in the French context are very much more put aside uh, by Ueda being to focus on the music and the uh, sunny Apollonian quality of symbolism that Verlaine brings uh, to the scene. So I will go uh, quickly toward this to explain Ueda Bing's strategy, but the idea is that uh, Baudelaire was uh, criticized in France too at the time. And Ueda Bing's uh, sources uh, being partial, we don't really know what he had access to, but he certainly didn't have access to the whole work either of Baudelaire or Verlaine. Uh, we can uh, imagine that uh, he, the way that he selected the poems uh, he wanted to translate already shape a certain vision of symbolism within the Japanese context that is very different than the French one. Um, so in Japan too, symbolism and especially this more shocking aspect were discussed and put into question uh, around the time with that being where I was translating them. And uh, here, let's just focus on, I'm going to have to go a little bit quick. So let's focus on the very last quote by Ueda Bing. Uh, Translation is art. Its purpose is not to serve as a guidebook. I already allowed, allied, al uh, I already mentioned this before, he has a very specific stance that says the translator has the right to make choices, has the right to orient the way he wants to translate, to select and to uh, really let his personal taste and his personal idea on text show through his translation. So in this uh, uh, sense, um, the translator is very much here shaping uh, what the audience and here the Japanese language readership is seeing from uh, the French text and the text that are coming to uh, them. And this is where this idea of the translation scape comes into play. So this is a, a concept developed by Jordan Smith, the idea that um, translation opens a window and, uh, op uh, onto one language literature here, French literature in the late 19th century. And uh, it has a very much uh, oriented a way of um, presenting a certain set of texts at a certain moment in time. So 
the idea here is that Bing was very much influenced by British aestheticism also, as I mentioned a little bit before, especially Walter Pater and Arthur, Arthur Simmons. So his idea of symbolism came to him, not directly necessarily from France, but also uh, going through uh, the British redefinition of symbolism in the late 19th century. So as a result, you have here um, uh, a, an author, a translator, who uh, creates a set of uh, a vision about French poetry in the late 19th century that is going to be very uh, different than the one that the French readers have inherited. And again, it's much more, um, it's much less focused on death and uh, scandalous contents as it is in France, and much more oriented towards joie de vivre. Uh, enjoying the moment, uh, the Apollinian celebration of music, life, and also as you can see here with Kinoshita Mukutaro or Yoshi Isamu, who are disciples of Ueda Bing, of uh, enjoying wine and good food, but to, with in moderation con uh, compared with the drug uses, for instance, of a Baudelaire. So I think my time is up, so I'm going to uh, stop here. So the idea here was, um, to try to see a little bit what translation can do in order to uh, create a textual heritage in a different language when we move from French to Japanese. And also again, um, this idea of maybe displacing uh, these canonical texts from here French to Japanese in order to look at them differently and maybe incorporating them more within the heritage that it can be still lived and appreciated. So thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Noel. Very fascinating presentation. I see that there is already a question, I suppose. So I don't want to take up any more time, but maybe Wayne Defremer, is that question mark a question from you? <laughs> or... No, I oh, I'm sorry. somehow snuck into the chat. Um, just, I, have... yeah. <laughs> I saw a question. questions. I, I saw a question mark and I assumed it was a question. Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. No, no, it's okay. <laughs> Um, so I, I know that Eduardo also has some, and uh, you go, you go. Should I go first? Yes. Okay, just as a means of, uh, as always, just kicking off the conversation. Um, I was wondering, you know, one thing that that strikes us is that your um, pitting against one another of can well maybe it's not as strong as this, but you. Um, creating this binary between the canon on the one side and heritage and the concept of heritage on the other side. Um, from within, what, from what we understand of, of heritage practices, we are also constantly kind of struggling with attempts to canonize or, or the effects that making something heritage have. So in a way, this, this role of, um, yeah, of, of making something into uh, something stable, making something into a stable object. We've, I think for myself and Eduardo maybe as well, we see this ongoing as an ongoing process in the heritage field as well. I was wondering if you can say something more about what kind of um, affordances, what other possibilities the, the label of heritage can give in the case of translated, translated texts in particular. Just okay, to elaborate a bit on that. Thank you. Yes, 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 yes. My, uh, that's a very good point. My, my whole uh, reflection starts by, from this thing that maybe I'm influenced by uh, the way uh, something like symbolism has been enshrined when you study French literature in France, as, as you mentioned, especially at, in a place like the Sorbonne. But I think today in the 21st century, that's we're talking about uh, a stable object that has been frozen in, this, in, in its status as a high literature is not viable anymore, right? This is a time where we are on the contrary, uh, focusing on um, the fluidity of these um, textual heritage and reception on these differences and also focusing on voices that have not been heard uh, previously, right? Um, taking again into context this idea of gender and race and so on. So in my experience, 
the fact that some texts are canonized work today against them, right? Uh, because they come with their share of uh, prejudice within, within the text themselves, but also many interpretation and preconception about them that uh, people are made to expect and um, ideas that come with these texts that are not necessarily directly linked to the text, right? So in this sense, um, I was very struck by what I think Professor Deneke was saying about heritage, the notion of textual heritage at putting back the text at the center, at the, at the text as an object, as a materiality at the center of the discussion, really looking at text and forgetting a little bit about the institutionalized discourse um, around them. So in this sense, uh, that's why I'm trying to maybe a little bit artificially uh, contrast canon and heritage, right? But I think uh, the fact that heritage focuses more in my understanding on fluidity, on personal understanding of text, on intimacy or participatory, participatory heritization, this is all, these are all elements that uh, play in favor of keeping these texts alive. So in the case of uh, translation, I, I see translation as, as one of these, um, uh, as a way of capturing text in movement, how they keep uh, being shared and in, reinterpreted and, uh, over different linguistic and uh, historical chronological time frames, right? Uh, frame, frames. So capturing text in motion is really one of the most important thing for me. And that's why translation is very, uh, it can be at the center of this idea of uh, re-evaluating canonical texts, especially coming from Europe, as uh, there's this um, problem that we discussed from the very first day of Eurocentricism in world literature. Thank you very much. I think in, in part you answered some of the questions that myself mm -hmm. and Eduardo were discussing during your presentation. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. And uh, maybe if Eduardo, I may... Yeah, yeah, right. You want to go on? I may uh, just, yeah, a reflection now, because the, the, the weak point in, in all this textual heritage thing is, in this case, is, it, it's so different to talk about canon and or heritage. That was your point too. And you're, I really appreciate how you, you understood the fact that heritage has a little bit wider um, meaning maybe. So it's not just uh, the, the up, down, uh, process of canonization. It includes and gives voice maybe to, to different instances uh, from, I would say, society. I, I don't know exactly uh, what this may mean. Um, I, I think it is important, maybe a, a thing that may uh, clarify how textual heritage may say something different or, or more compared to canonization is exactly the, 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 the role of translator that you said is translator as um, as actors, okay, and that was very um, inspiring because it it tends to um, connects to the idea of heritage uh, practitioners. So that that heritage is not just the thing; it's not just uh, the, the 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 rocks of Stonehenge, for example, but it's more what people in the present do with those things that are rocks, uh, buildings, or texts. Yes, and and the, the role of, of the translator that, of course, we have translation studies. It's, it's in, an important topic inside the, uh, literary studies. But still, you have the author, this heavenly being, the author. And then you have all the rest, so commentators and, and translators that are not often put on the center of, of the of the of the discourse. With the, the, the perspective of textual heritage, maybe if we see translators as the real actors that do reproduce the text in the present in many forms, of course, changing it because every translation is, is a retranslation. Um, I think we can uh, understand what textual heritage may uh, tell us more than just text, uh, textuality, and, and these things. So it, it was just a, um, my, my feeling, so not really a question. 
Yes, but I, I really agree with you about these categories that need to be re-examined of a creative writing translation, translation being clearly put in a lower rank. Um, yes. But these are, these are uh, problems or that have been discussed uh, heavily, right? With someone like Lawrence Venuti or Susan Bassnett since at least 20, 30 years. And I think it's very good because the Japanese context really shows something different. Someone like Ueda Bing, but let's think also of people like Mori Ogai are really author translator and they consider their work, their translation work as creative writing in an unambiguous way. So they're not encumbered by the same uh, hierarchy that exists uh, very strongly in the European context. Yes, and, that, and that's great. Would, the, 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 the concept of canon is not enough to, to, to explain that, maybe from my point of view. And we, if I can follow some up, other words. Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry. I see that Professor Harry go. also has, uh, has a question, oh, yes. so I'm going to. Is it only, only a quick one. Is just say, thanks for the fantastic paper, really good. I've been in Denmark for about three years now, and something that it struck me as a bit surprising when I came here is just how central there is a there is a Danish canon for this, that, and everything for food, for for history, you name it. There's a Danish canon for it, and of course, in when it comes to literature, the central Danish character in this is Hans Christian Andersen, who, as it happens, is probably the one of the most translated and you know reimagined characters or writers anywhere. And I just think I think it's it's fascinating listening. I mean, often he talks, he, he taps into a folkloric imagination anyway. But you can see how how his works have been translated in a very creative manner and reimagined in all sorts of settings, far far beyond the any sort of sense of control of a canon, which might that that might suggest. And I think this is so. This you're, you're tapping it. To me, I can see a parallel. You're tapping into that similar space about the. The creativity of the of the the trans you know that that creativity of the of the translator that can allow things to do to to happen in a different way whether it's transgressive or whatever it's it's uh, really you know I don't know it's a comment really rather than a question just really just fascinating though yeah well, thank you very much and I'm extremely happy you mentioned Anderson because. It, it, he plays a major role actually in uh, the kind of literature and poetry I'm interested in the Meiji era through the way he was translated by Moriogai again. Uh, he really, the translation of Moriogai of a text by Anderson, which I think within the Anderson canon is not a very important text. It's Sokyo Kushijin in Japanese, I don't know the original title, really was the way that Moriogai managed to create a new literary language within this whole uh, debate that was happening at the time between uh, the Genbun Ichi movement, so trying to um, create a language that was as close as possible to the oral uh, spoken Japanese, and people like Moriogai or Ueda Bing were very much against that, and the idea that they had to, on the contrary, create a new modern literary language, and it is through the translation of Anderson that Moriogai managed to do that. Thank you so much. I see one more question. We have a, a minute. So if, if Heidi, Professor Abule, would you like to ask a question? Um, we cannot hear you yet. Uh, so, uh, something like a follow up. Uh, um, uh, first a question. So um, you, you mentioned all this manga and popular no novels and uh, they are or, or always quoting this first line. Do they just quote this first line or do they refer to the rest of the poem as well? So, and um, if, uh, if they just quote the first line, so may maybe this all could be better described in the um, terms of uh, memory, cultural memory, because of course, uh, this entered, obviously this entered Japan by, um, kind of canonization, but then uh, like getting a life of its own. Yes, thank you very much. That's an extremely good point. And I really like this idea of cultural memory because the musicality obviously helps to uh, just put this line within the head of people and like a, a song that gets stuck in your head, right? And mm -hmm. very much, what I, from what I've seen, is very much the first line, which is interesting because uh, syntax, syntaxically it's, it's unfinished, right? It's a uh, uh, Aki no hino, violon no tamen ki no, 
so it, it should go on. The sentence is unfinished, but this is the one that people remember. So it's, it shows that in the way this, this musical quality has really successfully been translated into Japanese because it's this sentence, which actually doesn't mean anything, is enough on its own to uh, stay within, as you say, cultural memory. Thank you for this comment. Thank you. And if I, if I may say something very, very technical just for a second, it might have something to do with the particle, right? Because it ends with no. And so maybe Absolutely. many people will perceive it as ga. So there's like a sentence there. Um, anyway, <clears throat> I, thank you so much. I see I'm looking at the clock. So unfortunately, I think this is all the time uh, we have. I think we tapped into something really exciting with the role of, of translators. And I'm thinking also of different media as well. I, you know, the fact that you incorporated manga and the fact that, you know, in my head, I'm thinking of Tsubo Uchi Shoyo and his role renewing theater, translating Hamlet. Anyway, so there is a whole um, sphere there that should be, that might have something to do with Bunge. And you, I, I noticed you translated it as, as art, but maybe there is something to, to work with um, within that space between art and what bunge means in that context. <clears throat> Just a thought. But um, let me now, so thank you so much. Uh, let's all uh, give a round of applause to uh, Dr. Lavelle. And um, my role is to, unfortunately, is to keep the, the time <laughs> as much as I can. So let me move forward. I mean, I wish we had more time for all of our speakers, obviously. Um, so let me move to uh, our next speaker. So I think we will remain still geographically, at least we will remain in Korea. I think um, Wayne the Farmer is talking from Seoul, from Korea. Um, he's associate professor at Sogan University in Seoul and his degrees are from Whitman College, Seoul National University and Harvard. Um, Wayne has written extensively about Korean literature and what he calls the socialization of Korean literary texts. I, I like the phrase very much. Wayne's research integrates approaches from literary studies, bibliography and design, as well as information science and artificial, artificial intelligence. And as Eduardo said at the beginning, we're all looking forward very much to learning more about the role of the digitalization of texts. Um, in and what this perspective can contribute to our conversation, ongoing conversation. Dr. DeFremery has worked extensively on Korean poetry, translating in particular, I think, 20th century uh, poets. In addition, he has another line of work, so to say, collaborating with the International Organization for Standardization, um, where he is a convener of a working group concerned with document description, processing languages, and semantic metadata, so very specific um, kind of research and work. We were also intrigued to discover that Wayne holds several patents and has won design awards as well. So I'm curious to see how these, all of these other aspects will play a part, if they will, in today's presentation. Um, so without further ado, the title of his talk is Representing the Sound of Sound in a Korean Poem, an exploration of what might count as textual heritage and how we might study it. So the floor is yours, thank you. Thanks for the really fantastic uh, introduction um, and for all your hard work, Andrea and Eduardo. Um, uh, I'm super happy to be here. Um, Dr. Lavelle, I think your talk was uh, really fantastic and actually wonderfully sets up mine. Um, as I think you'll see, a lot of the texts, or at least some of the texts that I'll be describing, uh, have a direct relation to Udabin uh, and Kaichon uh, and translation and these sorts of things. Um, let me share my PowerPoint. And expand. I can this so that I can see you while I'm presenting. Uh, let's see if I can get this to go now. Okay, that's better. We can see a bit more than just one slide, but if that's okay with you. Oh, that's okay. You know, it'll be sort of a preview as I go, I guess. <laughs> um, so again, thank you for, um, 
for the opportunity to uh, talk this evening. And yes, I am a little bit uh, north of Seoul. I'm going to be talking about a text that actually counts as textual heritage in the sense that it's already been recognized by the South Korean government as a cultural asset. Uh, and this happened in 2010 uh, and 2011. Um, and it was happening at a time when I was working on my doctoral dissertation. Uh, and I happened to be studying this text that was made a cultural asset. Um, and so I was tangled up in cultural and textual heritage uh, before I even had sort of considered the term. <laughs> so, so I'll be sort of going back over that and thinking how um, we might consider and what we might think about uh, in terms of textual heritage. I think we might wanna really uh, consider the idea of perhaps contextual heritage, uh, the idea of inheritance of you know, getting things passed down um, it always comes with a context, uh, and we inherit those contexts too, I think, as well. Uh, and so I'll be talking about this book that's A, canonical, uh, B, has already been sort of acknowledged as textual heritage, uh, and using this book uh, and this particular phrase, and actually one particular word as a kind of reference point for thinking through some of the boundaries between um, text and context, a copy and an original um, and how we might study this thing uh, we're thinking of as a sort of, or even considering what uh, textual heritage might mean in the, in the ways that we might study it. <clears throat> so the, the game plan is to talk about the 2010. So I have a couple different sort of periods that I'll be looking at. Uh, 2010, when Korea, the South Korean government um, uh, enshrined, if you will, uh, this canonical book, Jin Da uh, by the poet Kim So Wall. Uh, it's a book translated as Azaleas. Um, I was right, like I said, working on my doctoral dissertation at the time. Um, I'll then uh, sort of play around with some key terms that I think uh, I don't have quite straight in my head, so I'm going to be kind of thinking out loud about these terms, heritage, documentary heritage, what's a document, um, in thinking about how we might study heritage and documents and documentary heritage, uh, I'll be thinking about bibliography uh, as, a, as a key term for a variety of disciplinary sort of practices that might help us think about uh, textual heritage. Uh, copies and copying, representation, re-presenting, <laughs> presenting again, uh, seems to be a key thing in textual heritage. And bibliography, if it's anything, studies how texts are represented and what they're representing. Um, and yeah, text versus context. And then I'm gonna sort of zoom through uh, some recent discoveries, which really changed my thinking about what counts as uh, Kim so -Wall's book and what counts as these sort of important copies that were used uh, as his book for long periods of time. Uh, there was a recent discovery of a third version of this canonical text. Um, and then how uh, people these days, uh, many uh, of whom are nameless or sort of go under uh, aliases, uh, who are doing the active work of continuing and sort of recopying Kim so -Wall's, uh, uh poem and book uh, into digital spaces. So this is kind of the, the arc of, of my talk today. Uh, apropos of, our, of, of um, uh, uh, Dr. Lavelle's uh, uh, talk, just wonderful talk just a moment ago, um, my doctoral work was focused in on um, books like this one, Onoe Mudo, which is arguably a translation of a translation because it borrows very heavily from Uyde Bin's <laughs> Kaichon. Um, so I was at work in trying to understand what counted as Korean poetry. And my question was how poetry might have mattered uh, in 1920s Korea. Uh, and I was playing, of course, on the idea of matter. Um, materially, how did these books how were they made? How were they produced? How were, what did they contain? Uh, you know, where did authors come from? And I was also, of course, uh, thinking about significance and how we might read um, poetry in contextualized by its materials um, and the back and forth between significance um, in a kind of linguistic sense um, uh, and a material sense. Um, how a book may have mattered. And so I was deeply involved in sort of bibliographic processes of simply documenting everything I could sort of document with a book. So where did, you know, who are the authors in the book? Who is the translator? Where was the book specifically? How big was it? What kinds of inks were used to print the cover? What kinds of materials were used um, in, the, in the papers and things like this? I transcribed all of the colophones, um, took notes on typefaces, 
um, bindings, um, individual glyphs and these sorts of things. To, again, to try and understand how poetry in the 1920s in Korea may have mattered. Um, and this led to a number of really interesting discoveries. Um, one of the discoveries was that the poets at the time in the 1920s were often the publishers of their own books. And nobody had known that before. <laughs> Some of the major authors, at poets uh, in the 1920s in Korea were uh, marked as the publishers of their books. I also discovered this one particular print shop was really quite important to um, literary production in the 1920s. Um, this was just, I found this by simply collating uh, the data in the colophones. Uh, and this particular print shop is called uh, Hansung Doso, uh, Jushik Heisa. It was a joint stock company, um, which also did publishing, but a lot of printing. Um, <clears throat> so my project was to look at all of the books that were uh, produced in the 1920s their copies, different versions and stuff like this. And I'd also become very interested in this poet, Kim so -wall. And so the project also included going through where he had published all of his poems and doing a similar kind of bibliographical workup of all the journals in which, journals, newspapers, um, periodicals in which he published. As I was working on this, uh, rumors in the sort of rare book community, uh, it was becoming clear that they, they were actually facts, <laughs> that there were in fact two different versions of this very canonical book. And they looked and are very, very different. Um, you have on the left, the book that people had sort of known about and on the right, um, the book that people had known about, but only rare book collectors and not academics primarily had known about. Um, and I was lucky enough to sort of uh, gain access to um, to this sort of recently discovered book. And I was working on sort of confirming uh, what it was and what its relationship to the known text was. I was racing my former advisor to sort of publish on this. And he of course beat me, <laughs> um, but kindly um, sort of uh, mentioned my work uh, in his publication. He was working as part of uh, a group that was essentially hired uh, by the um, Cultural uh, Heritage Association administration in Korea to make this particular book uh, a cultural asset, a munhwaje uh, in Korean. Um, and so he, he and I were sort of bumping into each other at the same rare book places, <laughs> these same private archives, um, and uh, comparing these books that we were finding uh, and both came to the conclusion that yes, indeed, there were two versions of this canonical book. That, was pub that were published or produced uh, in and around Christmas in 1925. Uh, Wayne, I'm sorry, I, I, don't, I don't mean to derail your presentation or anything like sure. that, but I'm, I'm getting a few messages from, from the floor saying that because the, the image is a bit small, they can't really read the, the slides. So can I ask okay. you to, to go to either put it in um, uh, full screen mode, sure. or maybe we can work a way, we can work out, work out a way yeah, let me see. I think I'm if so sorry, you could but it... change the display settings, the display settings there, there might be a possibility. Okay, uh, let me see if I can, because uh, I'm seeing it actually on my full screen. So this is odd. Let me see if I can change. Ah, no, that's the wrong one. And sometimes it's perhaps easier to stop sharing and resume sharing again because it kind of. Gotcha. I'll do that. Yeah, and, and select the, the the full screen window between the the, the, the options. Maybe it will be possible when you click the sharing button. So yeah, I apologize to everyone, but I think in particularly this slide comparing the two yeah. editions was important to see. Yeah. Uh, are you seeing are you seeing my screen now uh, better and more fully? A little better now. A little better. Maybe, yeah. maybe like this. If I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, yes. simply move that out of the way. And yeah. Zoom this in so that I'm yes, not, yes, yes. Yeah. That may work. Thank you. Sorry. No, no, thank you for letting me know. I was paying attention to what I was saying and not to the chat. So <laughs> it's all right. Thank you. Um, so, so here I was at work uh, on this text as part of a project uh, to try and understand the publication of uh, poetry in the early uh, 20th century in Korea. Uh, like I said, uh, and coming to the conclusion, yes, indeed, there were two versions of this canonical text. Um, 
uh, differences in typography, uh, very subtle differences um, uh, in specific glyphs, um, different distributors uh, for the text, um, identifying uh, essentially two different versions. And so of course, then the, the, the uh, sort of cultural or textual heritage question became which one to sort of uh, make the cultural asset, <laughs> right? Which versions? Um, uh, and this debate went on and on with lots of people throwing out lots of ideas. Um, most of which, many of which were interesting. Uh, but what I also ended up getting even more interested in at the time was this particular text, uh, which was a facsimile produced in the 1970s. And the reason that I got so interested in this particular facsimile is because of this, this particular phrase, uh, sori do uh, In the facsimile, uh, it's spelled to sound, the, the sound of sound is sori. But in all, and, and this is how it was represented in all of the sort of critical scholarship um, related to this book. It was, this is how the, that particular line was reproduced along with many others um, like these differences um, in the um, critical editions produced by South Korean scholars. And I was quite interested because it's not how the text was presented uh, in the books from the 1920s. Um, typographically, it was unique, and the sound of sound was different. Instead of sori do wopshi, you had sore do wopshi. Uh, and so in the two extant versions that we had from the 1920s, as far as I could tell, um, uh, the facsimile maker in the 1970s <laughs> had basically edited the text. And then the edited text had become sort of the canonical thing around which um, uh, literary scholars had built sort of... Um, uh, the presentation of this textual object uh, had sort of canonized it. Um, and at the same time, uh, were working to um, create and make uh, this text a cultural asset uh, of South Korea. Um, and my feeling at the time, and still to a certain degree, uh, was that the facsimile was actually the more important text for, the, for, for a good portion of the 20th century. Uh, that, that was the text that most people were engaging with and were, were reading, uh, not these earlier versions. In fact, some of them had been lost and only recently been rediscovered. So textual heritage and thinking about texts and inheritance and what we get, um, we can see how where there's often a drive to get to the original. <laughs> Oftentimes the original is gone or missing or transformed. Um, and the text that people use on a sort of everyday basis uh, and around which canons are built um, are often copies. Um, uh, and sometimes uh, what looked like um, copies that had been edited or transformed. Um, this leads me into sort of some definitions um, and questions. Uh, heritage has often been sort of described as, um, or thought about, especially through and because of UNESCO, as, as having to do with monuments and buildings and archaeological and natural sites, these sorts of things that are considered for a variety of reasons uh, significant. The um, uh, documentary uh, heritage sort of idea and the Memory of the World project, where documents are are considered significant and enduring uh, for specific communities, um, that they provide means for understanding social, political, uh, and you know, collective and personal history, um, uh, access to sort of collective and personal history. Um, and that they're situated in a, in a sort of, um, uh, in an apparatus where documents can, can come to suggest identities for states and for communities. Um, so uh, where document, documentary, documentary heritage reflects uh, a certain state's memory and identity uh, and thus contributes to determining how a country, basically a whole community of people, uh, is sort of positioned in a global community. This is pretty powerful sort of ways of thinking and I think pro uh, at some levels pretty problematic ways of thinking about how uh, documents work, but I think they do work that way. Um, and so it's recognizing, I think, in some ways, how documents work. Documents are defined in this sort of way of thinking about the world um, and how memory might work um, as analog or digital content things and carrier things. There's a sort of form and content thing going on uh, in documents. And crucially for what I'm uh, hoping to talk about today, um, documents can be copied. Uh, Documents uh, 
as uh, it's defined by the Memory of the World project, are things that can be copied um, and migrated. Um, this is not how I'd often thought about documents. Um, I've been interested in been reading um, uh, about the sort of uh, documentalist movement um, in Europe, uh, sort of in the mid 20th century, uh, authors like uh, Suzanne Brie, uh, who would define uh, a document as evidence in support of a fact. Um, she thinks about documents as uh, physical and symbolic signs preserved or recorded intended to represent, to represent, to reconstruct, um, to demonstrate a physical or conceptual phenomenon. Um, so there's, a, I think, some productive space between the ways that, say, UNESCO is thinking about what a document is and um, sort of definitions by people like Suzanne Brie, uh, Michael Buckland, Ron Day, and others who consider themselves sort of, uh, I think they almost talk about it jokingly as sort of new documentalists. Um, one of the interesting things about Brie's definition is that she makes it so that uh, living creatures can be documents, uh, stars can be documents, um, uh, which really expands the idea of document to actually overlap with uh, heritage studies as it's sort of been defined as sites and locations and natural um, uh, areas. Um, she has this fantastic bit about um, an antelope. Can an antelope be a document? And she says, yes, if the antelope is in a zoo and is meant to stand for other, represent other antelope. <laughs> if it's in the wild, it's not a document, but if it's in a zoo, it's a document. A photograph of a star is a document, but the star is not uh, necessarily a document. Um, and so this provides, I think, an interesting way to sort of overlap uh, with other definitions of, of heritage and bring textual and documentary heritage sort of into an overlapping space with uh, other forms of heritage discussions and heritage studies. For my thinking, to sort of summarize this uh, as a sort of fallback position, I often want to look at the sort of etymology of words and how we might think of heritage as an idea. And heritage, of course, has is associated with um, inheritance to receiving things. In <laughs> um, the Korean pronunciation of these uh, sinographs, uh, yusan, um, which can sort of be roughly equivalent to heritage, it suggests things that are sort of left behind and also what follows. And the glyph uh, pronounced san in Korean uh, also suggests, helpfully, I think, in this particular context, um, suggests things that are brought about, produced, created, given birth to, right? Um, and this, I think, is really sort of central to um, how we might, if we want to use the term textual heritage, might start to think about it. And if we do want to think about it in those terms, then I think bibliography, this sort of old, sort of forgotten <laughs> um, um, constellation, I'll call them, of different disciplinary approaches to texts um, might be very helpful for studying uh, this and working under the banner of something like textual heritage, if we find it useful. Um, bibliography, of course, has to do with the writing out of books, the copying of books, and later then the studying and describing of books. Um, there are, I think, many as many different definitions of bibliography as there are stars in the sky. <laughs> um, every different culture sort of comes at it from a different angle and different periods and different authors have many uh, ideas about how you should sort of keep track of records and record records. Um, there's a kind of recursive thing that goes on. You have writing and then writing about writing and then more writing about more writing and so on and so forth. Uh, but how we account for the things that are written, I think, is a big part of uh, bibliography. Um, Patrick Wilson, uh, a librarian and information scientist, has talked about bibliography as kind of splitting, especially in the Anglo-American traditions, between list makers um, and studiers of text. And what he means by the, in this sort of split, he sort of organizes, I think, helpfully, um, at least conceptually helpfully, uh, sort of what people do in library information science, sort of library science turns into information science, uh, cataloging of books and things like this. And then on the other side, it was kind of humanity side, you have studiers of text, people who are doing analysis and critique, sort of your textual uh, critics and textual scholars. Um, uh, I would suggest that we could do both <laughs> and helpfully get help from sort of both sides of this divide for, for figuring out um, how to think about uh, textual heritage. Uh, these would be the, you know, this woman would be the, the list maker and the sort of Greg Bowers uh, new bibliography, analytical bibliography, uh, sort of model for uh, studying books as material objects. 
um, was sort of what um, Wilson had in mind when he was talking about the studiers of texts. For me, to summarize briefly for the purposes of today, um, uh, the idea of bibliography in a way that I think is helpful, helpful for a conversation about textual heritage um, is are some statements in a book by uh, D.F. McKenzie, Don McKenzie. Um, and he, in his conception of bibliography as a sociology of texts, describes bibliography um, as a discipline that studies texts as re in recorded forms, as recorded forms, the processes of their transmission, uh, including their production and reception. So how texts are created, how they're transmitted, and how they're received as a, as a way to think about what bibliography does. Uh, he defines text really broadly in really useful ways, I think, for thinking about textual heritage text as to include visual, oral, and numeric data in a variety of forms, maps, prints, music, archives of recorded sound, film, video, computer stored information, basically everything. <laughs> um, uh, and uh, being from New Zealand, he was deeply interested in sort of interactions between uh, encroaching Western uh, uh, peoples into Aboriginal lands and goes into a great length discussions of how the landscapes can be uh, considered texts uh, and has this fantastic uh, sort of description of this uh, stone um, sort of in the center of Australia, known as the dog stone now these days. Um, but as part of his argument for sort of the breadth with which we can talk, think about bibliography for studying texts, he brings landscapes in as texts. Um, again, this I think provides a useful uh, bridge between what's often seen as quite uh, a big distinction between sort of heritage and the idea of a sort of place uh, of localities of monuments and things like this and of say documentary or textual heritage. So I think Mackenzie provides uh, a nice um, middle ground. Um, uh, bibliography as Mackenzie describes it and has many others around the world have sort of uh, worked at bibliography or doing things that we might call bibliography. Um, at its core, it's dealing with copies, uh, with reproductions. Uh, and I wanna sort of meditate on the idea of copies as sites of connection and distinction. Because copies have this wonderful thing where a copy is not its original. <laughs> it represents, it presents things again, it reproduces. Um, for certain purposes, uh, copies can be fungible. You know, you have two copies of dollar bills in your pocket you wouldn't want them to be the same thing because then you'd only have $1 bill, right? So, 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 that, so you can use money uh, and, and $1 bill can stand basically for any other dollar bill, um, but they're distinct uh, in time and space. Uh, and copying uh, and copies create contexts. Um, they create connections through, similar, through similarity, but also distinctions uh, in time and space. Uh, copy wonderfully etymologically has to do with abundance copiousness. Um, uh, and I think uh, thinking about copies, especially in this context of textual heritage, the abundance of uh, avenues that copies provide for contextualization uh, might be very fruitful for our thinking about uh, if we want to use this term textual heritage, um, and then also how we might study it. Context. Context is this wonderfully slippery term that um, every time you try to grab it, right? Every time you try and look at a periphery, the thing that's on the edge that articulates the thing you really want to be looking at, the context that makes it so you can understand the meaning of the text, it sort of slips away. In information science and especially uh, information preservation early on, people ran into this problem where they were trying to sort of contextualize all the stuff you needed to sort of document to make sure a computer system worked. And they realized it was endless. <laughs> and where they decided to stop their descriptions, they called this uh, a girdle end uh, after uh, Kurt Gottel uh, and, and his idea of um, this, uh, he was a logician uh, who wrote about incompleteness. Uh, and the point was that there are sort of certain limits that you just have to set uh, for context. Um, especially when you're describing things for preservation. Uh, context, the, the English word comes from connectus, the idea of connection, um, and also uh, to weave and weave together. And so it's very, very, very closely related to uh, the idea of a text. Um, um, uh, uh the Korean pronunciation uh, for these sinographs, um, context is kind of circulatory systems. There are these connections and distinctions, and I think there's a flow oftentimes back and forth that uh, we can 
understand and explore by means of copies and the ways that copies contextualize um, each other uh, and our ideas and how we might understand things. So big picture for um, considering uh, textual heritage and how we might approach it. I think Mackenzie Fein brings a really wonderful sort of um, potential way to investigate uh, texts uh, through what he calls their sort of sociology. All of the people and contexts and machines and papers and everything else that sort of swirls together and is, and is woven together by a text. Studying that way, he suggests we can uh, enable what uh, Foucault called the insurrection of subjugated knowledges. It opens up um, avenues that we haven't thought of before. It, it brings people to light that we hadn't seen before. Printers we didn't know were printing books, print shops that we didn't know were important, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, it gains, it, it provides access to the sort of social motives uh, in a text. Who made it? Why did they make it? Uh, and simply by uh, its own comprehensive logic and really sort of indiscriminate inclusiveness sort of testifies to the fact that texts are being remade, right, all the time, uh, that we have new readers making new texts, uh, and they're making them as a function and in uh, interaction with uh, these new forms that these texts are taking. So a kind of uh, leading towards uh, sort of my conclusion and heading towards um, this rediscovery of this, uh, of a new version of this canonical book that has been already um, uh, designated a, a textual asset uh, uh, in South Korea. Uh, I wanna do a kind of, um, uh, sort of quick sort of series of examples of how copies create uh, and uh, enable us to investigate sort of contexts. So on the left, we have a Google sort of um, uh, version of the, of the Korean Peninsula. And on the right, um, uh, a map of Chosen, uh, a map from um, 1930. Um, and they're quite different. We don't have any dividing lines, but they suggest in their own sort of, by ju you know, juxtaposing them, we can think about um, issues of power, imperialism, all sorts of different issues by putting them side by side, um, uh, by comparing copies and looking at the kind of context that they, that they create. Uh, context in leading up to a discussion of this canonical book in the 1920s uh, have to do with um, uh, the Japanese colonization of Korea in 1910. Um, this really shut down the presses uh, in, the, in the 1910s. Uh, the 1919 independence movement, which brought on essentially the opening up of the texts, uh, a big period of sort of uh, transformation technologically with the introduction of railroads and things like this, huge shifts in education, girls being educated in schools that look very much like ours today. <laughs> um, important for our conversation too, uh, the tourist industry starts to take shape uh, right around the time that this book that I'm going to be talking about uh, and have been talking about uh, was published. Uh, so people with money start to get fancy, they get fancy cars and they start driving around the countryside to, to what? To investigate her heritage, right? That's what we call it these days. They go to the beach uh, as tourists uh, and just to enjoy the sun. <clears throat> The context also have to do with our sort of post-colonial positions. Uh, Korea was um, uh, liberated uh, from Japan um, at the end of the Pacific War. Uh, it, it was, you know, everyone was super ecstatic and then <laughs> you have other forms of imperialism. Um, you know, the Russians and the, and the Americans basically dividing up uh, the peninsula. This has framed uh, a lot of how um, people have thought about this text that I'll be talking about. Here's the poet, Kim Sewall. wall This is the only picture we have of him. Um, uh, and here, these two books also, as copies of each other, contextualize each other. They tell us different things. They, they provide connections and distinctions um, that help us to try and make, it, make decisions about what they mean and how they should be significant and how they might fit into conversations about what counts as a cultural asset, a textual asset, uh, what counts as textual heritage. Uh, each of these pages as copies of each other are connected, but they're also distinct and create context for us to examine. Uh, the facsimile, later copies, um, we can see how the copies were bad. Um, uh, in this particular case, we have, you know, sort of blue moonlight is turned into blue horse light or something because um, uh, something went wrong with the copying. <laughs> um, we see changes in the text. Uh, taking this wonderful literal, um, alliterative line, kashin and korum, korum, and really kind of for anybody's ears who are tuned a little bit to Korean uh, prosody, uh, something that really 
great kashinen korum kyorum. It just it's a it's a typo, but it's brought in and repeated actually as part of the literary tradition um, in um, uh, in the work of scholars, sort of organizing uh, canonical organizing Kim Sewall's book into. Um, critical editions later on in the 20th century. And then this passage again, Sori uh, um, Wapshi. When I first encountered this, this passage especially made me think that, that scholars, this and a couple of others, made me think that scholars were using the facsimile as the basis of their critical editions. Uh, because sound is pronounced, like I said, Sore here in the extant versions from the 1920s and Sori in the facsimile. And I thought, aha, somebody's messing with the text. <laughs> uh, but uh, indeed I was wrong, <laughs> it turns out. <laughs> uh, and the reason I figured out that I was wrong is because very recently yet another version of uh, this uh, canonical text was discovered. And in that version, we have the same uh, experience Sori uh, Duopshi, the same sound of sound, uh, which suggests that in fact the people making the facsimile were working from a previously undiscovered version of Kim Sewall's text, uh, yet distinct, another distinct version um, of his text. The point that I'm trying to get to here with this sort of sound of sound is that copies uh, provide, again, context uh, and um, they shift the ways that we can understand textual heritage and suggest that we sh when we're thinking about textual heritage that we might also think about what we're inheriting as context. In the context of these two books uh, on the left, this looks like uh, it's been amended, like people are um, changing the text. Uh, this provides a new context which suggests, uh, no, perhaps they were actually, the editors, uh, the facsimile makers were actually working from a text that may uh, descend from when the poet lived in the 1920s and when the book was produced in 1925. Um, I realize I'm running up a little bit against some time, but uh, as we think about this, we can try and also put, well, okay, so if that was actually how the text was, then how do we explain that there are sort of two different pronunciations of the word sound, one sore and one sore. How do we contextualize this and how do we think about that? And how does that contribute to what we might inherit or how we think about what we inherit as Kim Soo Wall's text? Uh, so we know that in Middle Korean, sore uh, is, is, and this is um, uh, from a conversation with one of my mentors, Ross King. We know that sore uh, comes uh, and is attested to in sort of the 15th century, but there are also other variants pronounced very similarly, sore. Uh, it's really more like sore and so would he, <laughs> they're very close. Um, we also have other variants in the 16th century. Uh, we can look into dialect uh, dictionaries. Uh, there's a sort of politics of dialect uh, and orthography in early 20th century Korea, um, where people in the North, where this poet Kim so uh came from, uh, were sort of advocates for a certain way of writing and using the Korean alphabet to suggest uh, their region's dialect was really sort of the true dialect. But we don't find that in those dialect dictionaries, um, this uh, word for sore, uh, for, for sound, sore, in those dictionaries, we find uh, sore. Um, so, so the linguistic context doesn't help us, although we learn about the inheritance. We can then look at typographical contexts um, and say, well, what's going on with the typefaces? And we can compare all these different typefaces um, and, and basically collect using a computer uh, all of these glyphs um, in these different versions and compare them and say, nope, they don't really match. Um, what's called the chichim, the sort of upward stroke of the uh, this uh, letter here, lil, uh, doesn't match these. Uh, and the... Um, the sort of long descending stroke, it's rather thin and it's rather thick uh, in the versions that we have. So we still have this sort of typographical problem. And we then go back to the print shops and try and understand that typical, typographical problem from the print shop where the book was made. Uh, and we say, okay, all of the typefaces from this particular shop don't match. <laughs> they look like this on the right side. But if we look at other typefaces uh, used by type uh, by print shops at the at the same time, we do find things that are similar, not exactly the same, <laughs> but similar. So this one from Tae Dong In Se So, uh, and this one from Han Sung Do So, uh, where Kim Soo Wall's book was printed. Uh, so again, we're trying to contextualize, and these this sort of contextualization figures and 
organizes, I think, how we inherit uh, Kim Sewell's text um, and bibliography as a sort of investigation of these contexts and a sort of stepping over of these contexts into other ones uh, is perhaps a useful mechanism for exploring it. Then this discovery, uh, I had no idea. I've read this book, I can't tell you how many times, and I had never noticed that, that uh, sound was pronounced two different ways throughout the book, that sori appears 15 times and sore appears 23 times almost equally. <laughs> um, and, then you, and then you try and contextualize that. Uh, how, how am I inheriting this word that I thought was the same? Uh, why did I, A, why had I never noticed this, this before? And then B, how do I make sense of this? Um, uh, and then you sort of might head into uh, sort of sonnet context and poetic context. Maybe it's explained by how the poem is sort of constructed. And you go in and you say, and you read it and you listen for how it sounds. And, uh, and I'll just uh, sort of read the last stanza. The poem itself on page 73 is this wonderful um, poem that's almost forgotten in Sowell's corpus uh, called uh, Bun Ulgul, or Powdered Face. It's about, it, the setting is basically three people at, at a bar <laughs> um, in the evening and a spring, long spring night. Uh, and uh, there are two people who are clearly close to each other and a third, um, uh, a woman with a with um, powder on her face comes close uh, and the smell of the powder is clear uh, as she's sort of pouring drinks for everybody. Uh, and then we have this sort of moonlight um, sort of spreading out over uh, the voices. Um, very reminiscent, reminiscent of sort of the symbolist poetry that we were just hearing about. <laughs> um, and then, whoops, and then we have uh, this last line, our last stanza, which goes, uh, and without going into too much detail, the in sort of the traditional way of talking about um, sound in Korean poetry, or one of the ways that's enabled by the alphabet, uh, is that we can sort of count bright sounds and dark sounds. We can notice that kude, the beloved, uh, the you in the poem, um, rhymes uh, with uh, sound. Kude, sore, kude, sore. And they create through the structure of the poem, a close relationship between sound uh, and the person who's being spoken to by the speaker. Uh, like I suggested, uh, Hangul uh, and the Korean alphabet, uh, it, it attempts to essentially copy out sound. The alphabet is supposed to represent the shape of your mouth as you're saying the consonants. Um, the vowel sounds are historically understood as bright or dark. Uh, and so the, the change from sore to sori changes this, the whole last stanza from uh, basically a kind of uh, bright sound, which goes right in line with uh, sort of the, the message, the linguistic content of the last stanza um, uh, to a slightly more neutral sound. Uh, sori is considered a, a sort of, the li ita is considered a kind of neutral sound. So it, inflect, it changes the inflection a little bit. When we're thinking about these things, we arrive at this kind of boundary, uh, I think, that connects and distinguishes sort of the representation of sound and sort of contextual expectations of sound as a sort of sonic bodily experience. We're hearing the poem in our heads. Um, at the same time, we're looking at it and trying to sort of make sense of these distinctions that we've found. Uh, I think this is a productive and interesting boundary to sort of play around with and think about uh, when we're thinking about textual heritage. In the last few minutes that I have, um, I want to talk a little bit about how this poem has been sort of recreated again and again, copied out over and over again. Um, not as many times as you might expect for, for Kim Sewell being so famous and such a canonical and heritageized uh, poet. Um, but if you go looking for Kim Sewell's Bun uh, Orgul on Google or through Naver, which is sort of South Korea's version of Google, um, you don't actually find very many versions of it. But what you do find are the versions of the versions that you do find all have Sori. The sore pronunciation has, is gone. <laughs> it's all gone. Um, so if you look uh, at, um, if you go through Naver, the first thing you get, this is also a kind of textual heritage issue. The first thing you get is a paid site, a paid database. You have to pay to get in. <laughs> this is the first thing you get. Uh, my university has uh, a subscription, so I went in. Uh, and when we go in and look at the text and the context 
uh, a sort of a digital environment, all of a sudden we have all these other boundaries that we can consider. Um, and so you go into the scripts that are running the poem and creating the poem. Um, we find that um, the major database vendor uh, had a PDF that they created at some point. They transformed that PDF into uh, what's called an SVG, a, a scalable vector graphic. Uh, they then uh, transformed that again, and they had to align that vector graphic basically up uh, with what's known as Unicode. Uh, another sort of international standard for representing, making it so that we can represent text from around the world. Um, here we have all of these contexts uh, articulating what counts as Kim Sawal's poem being represented, being copied out in digital space. And I think these, again, in a sort of um, conversation about uh, textual heritage, and I think how we probably should think about it as sort of contextual heritage at the same time, uh, these kinds of standards uh, become quite important to consider as part of the legacy, part of what's inherited with the text. You go on, if you want to use the Unicode values to actually display a specific glyph, you need a typeface. <laughs> there are standards for those, which are also um, displayed and organized um, by this database. And they actually did some work. They had to actually find some old characters. Um, and put them into their typefaces um, so that they could display the, the, the uh, poem as far as they were concerned correctly. <laughs> uh, more context to consider as part of our inheritance of this uh, particular poem and this particular uh, text. These contexts and these comparisons, I think, uh, which are enabled by copies and copying, I get, we arrive again at a different, another kind of boundary. And this one is a, a boundary that connects and distinguishes sort of representations of sound and the con textual abstractions uh, that formulate, I think, our visual and auditory um, bodily experiences and vice versa. There's a back and forth between sort of the abstractions we use to think with and feel with. Um, they're bodily, but they're also conceptual. And there's, and there's a boundary there that, uh, that context creates. And depending on how you think about context as sort of being um, something that connects and distinguishes, but also maybe as a circulatory system, there's a, there's a back and forth across that uh, boundary, I think. Um, and these are the Unicode uh, numbers. These are the code values uh, that will display in decimal form that will display the sori, the ita of sori of sound uh, and the sore uh, of uh, sound. <laughs> uh, to sort of finish up uh, and take us back towards um, discussions of heritage as places, uh, um, sites, locations, uh, and a way that uh, we might investigate them uh, using bibliographical methods uh, and investigating copies in the context that they create. Um, if you go through Google, one of the first things that you find in terms of reproductions of Kim Sawal's um, uh, powdered face, you'll find um, uh, a site called Wikisource. And this is basically Wikipedia for old sources. <laughs> this is a community-based thing where people just contribute poems or stories or whatever text they think are important. They upload them and they edit them. Uh, and because of the Wikipedia infrastructure, we have a very detailed record of who edited what when. Uh, we know who's editing and how they're editing. Uh, and from that kind of information, we can really, it, you know, it, it's amazing the kind of um, sociology, <laughs> sociological sort of things that we can learn about the people who are interested in Kim Sowell's text. One of his editors um, of this particular poem, we don't know his or her name, uh, but uh, his or her profile suggests that, um, that he or she, uh, her, his or her first language is Korean, uh, but she or he also has an intermediate uh, command of English, has a basic familiar with Japanese. And I had to look this up. Also knows um, Pislama. Uh, uh, and, and that's uh, from, for those you know, uh, who aren't familiar with that language, uh, it's from the island nation of um, Vanuatu uh, in the South Pacific. So all of a sudden we're going back out from the text uh, to, explore, to explore a really sort of large um, uh, sort of geographies. Um, from this particular editor uh, who goes by the alias, which is associated with their IP address, the internet protocol address, which locates sort of where they are in the world or the computer is anyways, uh, we can do a kind of trace and figure out where this person was actually working from. Um, we can figure out that they were in Seoul. Uh, we can figure out that they were in uh, Myeongil Idong in Kangdonggu, uh, which is sort of south of the Han River down here. Not the really 
expensive part over here, but really a pretty wealthy area of Seoul. Uh, and we even with our new technologies get very intrusive technologies can actually get to the corner. Um, I don't know if we're looking in the right direction or not, but we can get right down to the location where this person was editing uh, Kim Sewell's text. So through the digital technologies that we have, we have these opportunities to sort of contextualize and recontextualize and think about how, um, who's making the text that we're inheriting? How are the contexts being uh, produced? How might we account for them? Um, and I hope that I've sort of suggested that. In sort of summary and in conclusion, I, you know, I th textual heritage, especially if we think of it as a kind of contextual heritage, I think provides a really useful framework for thinking about inheritance in general. Um, uh, I think bibliography, like I was trying to suggest, also provides a productive framework for sort of doing the work of contextual heritage, if we find that a productive term. Um, I think though, and my worry is that the, the actual doing of the work might be very hard, um, that there are sort of hard boundaries between um, sort of the history as uh, 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 in what you heard in some of the keynotes, there, there are sort of hard boundaries between people who do, for example, memory studies versus history. Uh, there are sort of hard boundaries between the sort of list makers, the information scientists and the studiers of books, the sort of humanists. Uh, there are kind of hard boundaries between nations. Um, the previous speaker was talking about sort of translation as, as a way to sort of go across uh, and make heritage, uh, in, in a sense, sort of almost transnational. Um, but national institutions formulate what counts as heritage at a lot of different levels, as uh, this particular text that I've been studying suggests. It's, it's instantiated by the South Korean government as textual heritage in Korea. So I, I'm excited by the idea, but also worried um, that um, the doing of sort of whatever we might call contextual or textual heritage uh, might be kind of... Um, stymied by uh, the sort of institutions uh, that we work in. But I would be super interested to uh, keep exploring and hope that uh, at some level that might not be the case. So with that, I'll conclude and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. This was really wonderful and it took us to Vanuatu. That's quite, <laughs> quite impressive and impressive flight we took. Um, I think for the moment, since I'm looking at the clock and we are running a little bit behind. Um, unfortunately, I think we might have to take questions perhaps together. It, I do think that this presentation will, will uh, connect really well with the next one. And I feel that particularly those of us who are maybe in Asia, including yourself, we may, we may need a little screen break just a few min for just a few minutes. So if you don't mind, I would probably, um, if you want to, in the meantime, if any of you wants to put questions in the chat, we will make sure to, um, to read them out loud afterwards. Um, that being said, I think it was really, I didn't want to interrupt, uh, although I could have been uh, sort of <laughs> rigid in that way. But first of all, because you were, you were confronting the, the notion of textual heritage direct, directly and providing this this further notion of or elaboration into contextual heritage, it, I really felt like we needed to have the, whole, the full, the whole picture. So I'll just thank you for now. And um, why don't we resume in uh, Eduardo, shall we say five past two? Yes, yes, that's perfect, I, I, I guess. Okay, so let's all give a round of applause to uh, Dr. DeFremery, and uh, I will um, see you, or we will all see you in uh, 10 minutes then. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Okay, here we are. I think everybody's in. Um, hello again. I hope you had your coffee or tea. And um, so we go for the for the third and last speaker of this um, symposium. And I, I couldn't think of a more suitable introduction for for next speaker than uh, Professor De De Fremery's talk before because he puts on the table a lot of 
topics that are, are, are will be shared in the next tool. So bibliography, copying, the idea of connection and distinctions of texts. And I, I would that add as um, as the firmary said, documents may be copied and texts may be copied almost without loss of information. You know, I can copy uh, a text if I, I, I'm careful, I, I can perfectly copy a text. I can do a perfect copy of Mona Lisa or some other uh, work of art. And so uh, I think this may be the real difference between textual heritage and other forms of heritage, maybe especially the tangible ones. So um, it is a pleasure to introduce you uh, our last speaker that is also a colleague and a friend from Kaposkari University and uh, that I already forced to participate to, to uh, a panel I organized last year. We talked about it already is uh, defining textual heritage at the uh, conference of the Association of Critical Heritage Studies. Um, I, I, I really strongly wanted that he um, to join us again today because his approach to heritage uh, is very intriguing and provocative, I think. Um, so I uh, introduce you Franz Fischer, that is Associate Professor for Medieval and Humanist Latin Literature and the Director of the Venice Center for Digital and Public Humanities uh, at the Depart Department of um, Human Studies at Kafoskari. Before coming to Venice in 2019, he has been working as a coordinator at the Cologne Center for E-Humanities uh, of the University of Cologne. During this time, he has been coordinating several digital humanities research projects, among others, the um, European Union funded Marie Curie Network on Digital Scholarly ed Editions, uh, Dixit. Um, Professor Fischer studied the history Latin and Italian Cologne and Rome and has been awarded a doctoral degree in medieval Latin for the digital edition of our treatise on liturgy by the Parisian master William of Auxerre. Um, he he has been in uh, as a postdoctoral researcher at the Royal Irish Academy in Dublin, where he created a digital edition of the Confession of Ireland's patron, St. Patrick, from the five, 5th century. He is a founding member of the Institute of, uh, for Documentology and Scholarly Editing, and he is teaching the, the, the summer school at this uh, institute. And he, he also the, the author of a series of digital editions, paleography and codicology, and a review journal on digital editions and resources, the RIDE, R-I-D-E. Uh, he's also editor-in-chief of Magazine, that is the International Journal for Digital and Public Humanities, and of Digital Medievalist, a peer-reviewed open access journal of the digital medievalist community. So, as you may imagine, uh, Professor Fischer's talk, Franz's talk, will be ex exactly focused on the topics of digitalization and canonization. And the title of his presentation today is Digital Strategies for the Decanonizations the canonization of textual heritage. Friends, thank you for joining. The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you very, very much, uh, Eduardo and uh, Andrea for this really uh, super interesting symposium. And uh, so there's so much I have to digest. So I would organize my talk in a very different way, maybe if I knew, <laughs> if I wasn't the last one here. So I'm sharing my presentation. Can you see and hear me well? Okay. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, so yeah, digital strategies of decanonization or more precisely um, digital humanities strategies because it's not uh, about the strategies that are digital but uh, the tools and methods that have been uh, developed in the field of digital humanities in the course uh, of the past decades um, and which might be applied as a part of a major strategy for the heritageization of texts. So when Eduardo me, uh, invited me to join the panel uh, on defining textual heritage on the, uh, the conference that uh, he just mentioned, uh, I ha happily accepted uh, as a medieval, medieval Latin uh, philologist, um, preservation 
of textual heritage is uh, the most natural thing for me to do, I would say. My pro profession uh, is to provide reliable texts that can be read, studied, and enjoyed. Uh, so taking care of textual heritage, creating representations of texts that are true, faithful, and authentic uh, is my business, I thought. And uh, so that is the uh, introductory part, uh, the heritage uh, and me, uh, like uh, uh, in uh, parallel to Wiebke's introduction. <laughs> uh, so in my talk today, I want to address two questions. First, uh, what can digital philology bring to the concept of textual heritage? How can textuality be defined? Uh, to what extent uh, do we uh, uh, have to widen and differentiate um, how can I move forward here with my presentation? Ah, okay. Uh, um, to what extent do we have to widen and differentiate our, our notion of text, uh, maybe? And the second, uh, how can digital textual uh, scholarship inform the practice of preserving and making accessible textual heritage? Uh, how can it be saved? Uh, and especially, how can we prevent the dis disastrous consequences uh, of a narrow-minded and one-dimensional perception of texts, the fatal uh, results of the selection of what is deemed worthwhile to be archived and preserved and what is not. So in short, um, how can we escape the archive dilemma and how can we solve the canon question or maybe avoid it? Um, and my answer will be um, by deselection and by uh, decanonization enabled by digital technology and supported by digital humanities tools. Okay, so part uh, one, uh, what do we talk about when we talk about textual heritage? What is a text? If we claim uh, we need to preserve our textual heritage, um, that is as naive uh, as to say, uh, save Venice. What Venice and how? Uh, inspired by a talk um, by our colleague Diego Calamont from Cafoscari, archaeologist, I think uh, early last year, uh, about the preservation of Venice, I realized texts and uh, cities have a lot in, in common. So what are you going to save if you want to save Venice? The architecture by conservation of the actual state, by restoration of a particular stage, Venice of the uh, Cinquecento, Seicento, Settecento, by the creative continuation of an always transforming, uh, self-reinventing city, adding contemporary architecture, or is it uh, the exceptional environment protecting the lagoon from the rising sea levels, waste and big ships? Uh, the people, uh, the city of the tourists, the city of the businesses, the cultural sector, the, the artists, actors, the city of the residents, uh, their language, their dialect, uh, their food and customs, uh, their feasts, culture, uh, religion, uh, the economy, including Magera, uh, and how are you going to save this? Uh, the city as a museum, a leisure park, a living organism, so a uh, very similar question arise when, uh, we, when it comes to text. Uh, in the library world, uh, the um, um, International Federation of Library Association uh, has developed a conceptual model to describe the functional requirements of, uh, of four bibliographic records, short Ferber. Um, according to that model, texts are treated as bibliographic records uh, and can be defined as an intellectual or artistic endeavor that can be described by means of four interrelated uh, entities, namely as a work, so Homer's Odyssey or James Joyce's uh, Ulysses, that can be uh, realized as an expression for example, the Greek original text of the, the, of the Odyssey, uh, as opposed to a translation, uh, or uh, the English original uh, Ulysses. And that original version of uh, the, the Odyssey or Ulysses can be embodied as a 
manifestation. For example, the fabulous critical edition prepared by the great scholar so-and-so, uh, which can be actually read and used as an item, uh, as the one copy on my shelf or in my library. So that is textuality in the library work world, and that works uh, quite well. I'm, I'm, that's my experience. Um, um, for a textual scholar, or even more so for a digital textual scholar or editor, textuality can be slightly more complex. Uh, this is the so-called uh, text wheel by Patrick Saale, uh, and might help to further differentiate the shades of textuality uh, to locate textual dimensions. Uh, if we apply these categories and talk about text in, text in terms of identity, when do we talk about the same thing when we talk about a text? Again, the text uh, can be perceived as a work uh, that can be identified by its title, its author, and its structure. We can talk about the first canto of uh, Dante's Inferno, the first chapter of James Joyce's Ulysses uh, in the original or in the translation. We always talk about the same text, so no, no doubt about this. Um, we can talk about text as a linguistic code, as a specific sequence of words, a string of characters. Uh, here, uh, um, a Japanese translation differs uh, completely from its original. We can also talk about text in terms of uh, specific versions, and we saw very nice um, uh, examples in the previous presentations today, where significant variants might occur between a first edition and a later edition, revised and modified by the author themselves, an editor or a, a scribe, a copist. Uh, and we talk, can talk about text as a document, a unique item, a specific copy, and we saw again very nice examples throughout the uh, symposium uh, from an author's library or a manuscript with a with a history. Well, everyone is very much interested in the history of such items here and very individual textual and material features, uh, maybe even an orthograph. Uh, and we can talk about a text as a visual sign, a work of art, an illuminated manuscript, a Japanese calligraphy or a calligram by Yoma Polymer, maybe full of symbolic features beyond the function of a character or the meaning of a reference. So even if you want to are able to express this in, in a number, you wouldn't capture that. Um, and this is where we come full cycle. Uh, we can talk about text in terms of its content. Uh, text is what it, it means. Uh, text as an immaterial idea, the message that uh, can be expressed and performed in many different ways. Uh, but remains the same in a platonic way. So you can dance maybe the meaning of our text. We had a nice example here. Now, uh, every text is all this uh, uh, always at once. Um, but uh, uh, when it comes to creating truthful um, representations of texts, uh, traditional uh, philologists uh, are very keen and strong in establishing one authoritative version, canonical text, ideally in accordance with the author's intention or any other editorial concept based on the analysis of witnesses and archival documents. Uh, and in the analog, uh, anal analog world, uh, a print uh, edition is, uh, there is a clear, um, preference for a synthetic, uh, normalized and critically reconstructed text. Whereas in the digital medium, uh, what's the next slide? Here? Ah, this is just an example, and I will come back to this uh, edition or this text of St. Patrick, uh, the patron saint, where I did a, a digital edition from uh, uh, during my stay at the Royal Irish Academy in Ireland. So in the digital medium, uh, by far the most scholarly editions focused on individual documents, providing first of all a visual representation because it's so easy, a digital facsimile. Uh, and then along with a transcript or multiple transcripts uh, and scholarly annotations. Uh, and ironically, um, digital text corpora usually benefit from earlier print editions and include those uh, retro digitized OCR uh, uh, synthetic text versions without the scholarly framework of 
apparatus and annotations and all that. There are, of course, exceptions to the rule, um, facsimile editions uh, in print or even handcrafted like this uh, silly example, maybe uh, uh, very costly and uh, very expensive uh, for exceptionally beautiful um, and illuminated or illustrated uh, manuscripts. Uh, the Book of Kells, for example. Um, or more often facsimile photoprint editions, uh, um, for example, of the Book of Armas, so that's the same context, so it's actually in the same uh, exhibition case in the long room in the Trinity College. Um, next to the Book of Kells, there's a very small <laughs> book, it looks a bit ugly, uh, uh, but um, uh, it's extremely important for the history of Ireland, the, uh, and Armagh, the, the uh, seat of Armagh, uh, as the religious center. Uh, of Ireland, the oldest witness of Patrick's uh, writing, uh, but in large parts uh, cut out. So it's a very problematic uh, witness if you want to recreate uh, uh, critical or the, an, an original version. Um, so uh, this is a, a, a facsimile print edition of 1960, I, I think. And we saw other examples today and how important they can be. Also, this is already a document which has a very great importance because for the reproduction, the, 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 the photo photographing, uh, the codex has been disbound, which you wouldn't do anymore today. Uh, and so you can read the inner margins. Uh, so there's also a marginalia in there, which you wouldn't be able to, to read in the uh, other, um, in a new photograph. Okay, um, where am I? There are scholarly uh, print editions representing uh, uh, a number uh, of uh, variant versions of texts, uh, pushing the book and page format to their limits. So like this year, the uh, um, widely acclaimed edition by, edition by Joachim Bunk of the Nibelungenklage, so the, 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 I don't know what's the English, but Nibelungenklage from 1999, a German medieval heroic poem, presenting four critical text versions with apparatus positioned on one uh, on two facing pages. Uh, or the um, monumental edition of uh, Eriugenas Periphyzion, so a medieval uh, theologian and philosopher, in five volumes uh, in the Corpus Christianorum series, establishing not only a critical text, which is of common type, uh, quote, easy to read and consult, uh, but also um, a synopsis of five variant versions as revised by the Irish author himself or contemporary scribes uh, displayed in uh, four parallel columns. On the other hand, there are digital editions providing critical text versions among all uh, the other versions they provide, the facsimiles, transcripts, translations, and so on. So this is uh, uh, very important. This is already textual heritage, digital textual heritage, I would say. Uh, the, the edition of the uh, Canterbury Tales uh, by Geoffrey uh, Chaucer published on CD-ROM in 1996, uh, the first comprehensive record of the textual transmission uh, transcriptions, uh, collation of uh, 58 manuscripts, um, but deliberately not providing a criti critically reconstructed text version. So Peter Robinson, the, the godfather, so to say, of uh, digital scholarly editing, 1996. The data uh, lives on, but uh, the, this edition is hard to, to, to reconstruct or re yeah, approach, access. Um, this is another example, uh, the Parsival uh, edition of uh, Michael Stolz, again, uh, emphasizing the variety of uh, the works transmission, uh, establishing, uh, but also establishing a critical text version. Um, here, no, we have critical text, and then we have uh, facsimilia and, and transcripts of the most important uh, witnesses. And here, so this is kind of a um, reconciliation or compromise uh, of uh, the Lachmanian tradition of reconstructing uh, um, um, an archetype and the tradition uh, that um, took up uh, um, after the criticism of uh, Joseph Bédier, so who's, who claimed that uh, tous les cas sont uh, spéciaux, 
uh, and uh, which then have been taken up by Bernard Chercoligne, Loge de la Variante. This has been re referenced earlier in the program as well. So uh, a compromise between old and new uh, philology. So these are uh, the variant versions in a synaptic view. Yeah, and this is the edition I, I created uh, in, in Ireland during a postdoc uh, um, uh, fellowship, uh, just uh, very quickly. So it's a critical text taken from the print edition, but so, uh, uh, with many functionalities um, included the, the manuscripts. So you click on the singular reference to the manuscript. You can compare the, 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 the critical text version with, with the witness text where you can zoom in. You have a lot of uh, other translations, so you can approach the text from any any uh, uh, um, language you are more familiar with than the original. Uh, all the manuscripts, print editions here also included the, the um, because it's a very important document. Again, the the um, facsimile edition, but also a um, uh, hyper diplomatic uh, print edition. Uh, uh, as a transcript of the same uh, witness again, Book of Arma, um, uh, with typographic uh, uh, artistry here, um, a representation of the original man manuscript. This is all included in many, many other features, also um, a performance, so an audio and uh, a romance, so a lot of stuff to make this more approachable to. Um, Patrick, so we, we are in the, so it's a running, not a running gag, so a feature, um, the, the Patrick was a small piece. So we had, I think, history with a small H, literary, literature with a small L, and this is about Patrick with a small P, not the super hero, not the super saint, but what we really know about this guy who uh, actually lived and wrote uh, on that island in the fifth century. So that's the idea of that project. Uh, yeah, this is just to show how I try to map the various uh, components of that edition uh, to that text wheel to show which features are especially relevant in the context of the whole uh, edition. So it's just to show. Uh, so every every uh, instantiation or version here uh, has all the characteristics of textuality uh, at any point, but. In the context of the whole edition, these are the most characteristic or interesting features. Okay. The critical text in these examples uh, is not necessarily the one and only authoritative text. Uh, it tends to be more the text that best explains all existing uh, witnesses. It might serve as an entry point, making us more confident in appreciating the witnesses. Uh, this uh, picture is by uh, Frantisek Kupka, uh, a um, Czech artist, uh, uh, Le Premier Pas, um, uh, the first step from 1909 uh, in the um, Museum of Modern, Modern Art. Uh, and it has been chosen as a cover for the critical edition of the Mahabharata uh, to better understand the concept of uh, origins and archetypes, singularity and plurality emanations and uh, transmission and the parallelism of cosmology and art so uh, which doesn't serve too much for our or my argument here today but i always wanted to include it in a presentation at some stage and uh, this is just a good occasion i think so if you like the analogy uh, like like i do uh, read the preface of um, 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 the editor sukta hanka uh, guide to mahabharata textual criticism uh, it's a print, by the way. Okay. So, I, and this is just to show uh, scholarship goes on. So, I created this wonderful um, edition, digital edition of St. Patrick, uh, which has already the, the touch and feel of an edition uh, of a resource of 15 or 10 years ago. And in the meantime, uh, a colleague created transcripts of all the manuscripts, uh, um, electronic and um, uh, coded transcripts. So, extremely uh, useful resource. And uh, yeah, uh, the challenge is to how to connect these uh, these progress uh, in, in scholarship. So um, uh, editions uh, are traditionally are outdated at some stage. Uh, that's not necessarily the case for digital resources, and we need to find ways to uh, open up 
additions and resources and uh, uh, components of additions uh, to create um, uh, complete resources, representations of the transmission and uh, contextual material. Um, then we have in uh, digital textual scholarship many other forms of uh, um, additions and methods in schools, just a very superficial overview. So genetic additions, for example, we had uh, here also an interest in um, the uh, creative process of, um, uh, of, the, uh, of the writing of an author uh, um, through drafts and sketches uh, and uh, the so-called uh, avant texts in, uh, in a dossier genetique. Uh, there are famous uh, genetic editions underway. So the Goethe, Goethe's Faust, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein's, this is Samuel Beckett. Um, and we have on the other, uh, side of the spectrum. We have docu document-centric editions of, of palimpsests, for example. This is a superstar uh, of, uh, in, in high-tech manuscript research. Uh, the, the Archimedes palimpsest, the, the Greek uh, mathematician, which has been lost and uh, um, um, covered by um, a new text. And this has been, by applying a wide range of uh, advanced imaging technologies, uh, the text underneath has been made visible again. So it's the only witness we have. So, uh, and this technology uh, um, is advancing, uh, advancing every day. Maybe you read in the news recently, they were able to read letters uh, with X-rays so without uh, opening and unfolding the letters or the Herculaneum papyri carbonized uh, the, the scrolls. So with X-ray, you can also decipher letters, words, maybe texts. So this is fast proceeding. So very much technology uh, driven and focusing on the uh, uh, material. Um, yeah, if you are interested in the Archimedes, he's also on, on PET, so a real star. Oh, here, these are LED tablets. Uh, so again, a different technology to make readable the text on um, tablets, which with the, the, the eye, you wouldn't able, be able to read. Uh, okay, the, the nature of uh, textual representations uh, has changed under the digital paradigm. Uh, so we uh, have access, uh, we have uh, no restrictions of space, modality, we can include uh, all, uh, we can include audio, video, um, we, uh, the markup, so we can enrich our transcriptions or texts, uh, um, making explicit uh, structures, uh, content semantics, uh, um, and uh, tr transform it. Uh, we can add functionalities to, uh, to text, uh, texts are fluid. Uh, it's more a process uh, than a product. Uh, we can collaborate, text can be open, we can interact with text, we can participate or have people participate in an editorial or in any textual heritage project. Uh, we have a, a, a important um, separation of data versus presentation. Uh, so data can uh, be presented in various ways, analyzed in various ways, and uh, um, it is not uh, determined by the presentation or a visualization of the data that we might have in mind, but others uh, might, might not serve to others. Uh, and this just very quick uh, achievements of digital editions, so the inclusion of facsimiles, uh, multiple text layers, uh, hyperdiplomatic, uh, genetic, normalized, corrected, critical, and so on, multiple witnesses, versions, annotations, uh, and analysis of various features, uh, functionalities and access, we had this, uh, and uh, the important point of distributed architecture, this is uh, gaining more and more uh, um, pace, here, yeah, so to include resources that are external to your representations. So like uh, facsimiles from research libraries that apply the IIIF standard. So you don't have to take care and create a silo of data and uh, are not able to maintain it. So to have distributed the tasks of representations to those who are the experts. So in that case, the, the librarians um, and uh, yeah, other ways. Um, so what does uh, this have to do with uh, our discussion about textual heritage? 
Uh, again, the text wheel, it's uh, very useful and from, uh, from a data perspective uh, uh, necessary to locate oneself on this or a similar uh, um, scale, circular scale. When we talk about fidelity or, or uh, authenticity uh, of um, uh, fidelity of, of what? So to, to the idea that could uh, be in fact advanced performance to the physical document, to the supposedly authorized uh, uh, latest version of the author. Uh, so that's, uh, you always have to um, um, define or be aware of the characteristics of your textual material and how this corresponds to your research question. And apart from widening our understanding um, and forcing us to be more explicit about our understanding of texts, about uh, our specific perspective when we model this into data and opera uh, operationalize uh, our questions. Apart from this, I think uh, digitization and digital philology can help to address two very serious problems that are at the heart of heritageizations and which we already uh, addressed uh, here. So uh, the archive dilemma and um, the canon question. Uh, the archive dilemma. Uh -huh. yeah, so this is just a picture I took up randomly from, from the web. Uh, um, I don't know where it is. Uh, so digital technology can help to escape the archive dilemma because traditionally what do arch archivists do? Uh, uh, so archivists are natural partners in this enterprise uh, for, um, as textual scholars and textual heritage curators. Uh, what they do is they throw documents away. So they receive countless collections and of countless documents and decide what to destroy. Uh, they select what they want to keep and what they don't want to keep. Uh, but most of the text textual material is going immediately into the bin, uh, uh, lost and gone forever. Because they can't keep everything, there is not, not enough space in the archive and there's not enough manpower to organize the material, to make it accessible and findable. So that's the dilemma. Uh, that is the case for modern documents, not so much for medieval or ancient manuscripts. Uh, here, the lapse of time uh, has done the job already. Uh, in a way, um, as a digital philologist, I am lucky that most of the manuscripts are lost. Uh, it would be impossible for any philologist to check uh, all the textual material that has been produced in the course of time. Uh, instead, I'm happy to make assumptions about uh, the a text and its tradition on the basis of just a few manuscript copies. And the best thing that can happen to an editor uh, or an edi edition project is to have only one excellent manuscript uh, witness, uh, then uh, you can be sure to finish your project while you live or are in, in business. And this is just, uh, this is, uh, has been the Cologne uh, City Archive, the largest city archive uh, in Europe, north of the Alps, uh, collapsed uh, on the 3rd of March 2009. 90% uh, of archival records were buried under the collapse. Uh, many of which have been recovered, but many of which have not been recovered. And this is just to remind us that uh, an archive is not always a safe place. So anyway, a mass digitization of texts, of manuscripts and archival materials basically prevents us from making arbitrary decisions uh, about what to keep and what not to keep. Uh, but then the problem is just postponed. A new archive dilemma is being created, or maybe actually two or even more problems. The one is the question of what first uh, to digitize, the other by uh, the massive uh, scale of data, how to make the amount of digitized archive material accessible. How can we find uh, what we are looking for? Uh, how can we tell what might be relevant for our research? Yeah, um, so artificial intelligence, OCR, handwritten text recognition, and other helpful technologies are constantly improving. I mean, they are not the solution for everything, even though it's always, if you are at a loss, people come up, but oh, there's transcribes and awkward. So, but, uh, okay. Um, so they are very useful tools and very um, efficient, uh, also for keyword searches and automated uh, indexation, for example, that will help and does help already. 
Um, uh, there is no time, I think, here to get deeper into this. And I'm completely, that's the other um, text recognition or OCR uh, technology. Yes, so, sorry to interrupt you, Franz, but you, you talk for 30 minutes, you, you can go on, just consider that the, the, the oh, time well, for questions will be less, okay. so, yeah. Okay, uh, then I have to rush, so, okay, um, sorry. Um, okay. So I skip, so we have the Wayback Machine, so in, in web archives, and we, uh, we have several projects to try to address the problems of digital uh, cultural heritage, we, which we haven't touched. So maybe Wayne, in the last uh, presentation, we touched on this, but we are more uh, um, uh, connected to the, to the past production of, of um, material uh, texts. So the canon question, very quickly. Uh, so this is a very uh, under-theorized uh, uh, list and I skipped this. So the um, heritageization of text is commonly performed by means of canonization. Uh, that is by the selection of works and versions, establishing a canon of texts uh, representing some specific cultural context or ideal. So the world literature ideal, for example. Uh, and establishing a canonical text version by applying literary and textual criticism. In contrast, uh, so that's maybe the point here, uh, digital heritage, heritageization of text is preferably performed by means of decanonization, uh, with a preference for deselecting individual works and versions by creating large digital corpora of texts, which also include neglected, supposedly less important works, uh, and by creating digital editions representing the plurality of uh, textual dimensions, layers, and perspectives. Uh, the corpus is being extended in two directions, if you will, so horizontally uh, towards inclusiveness and vertically towards the plurality uh, of multiple textual layers. Um, so uh, deselection uh, and decanonization as a strategy of inclusion to avoid marginalization or oblivion of divergent, intersectional, non-well-established, innovative, emergent, uh, so non-canonical uh, literatures, whereas digital textual heritageizations allow for the preservation uh, and unbiased, pluralistic, inclusive, diverse representation of textual heritage, ideally. And at the same time, for uh, access to and critical engagement with the material, identification, analysis, reconstruction, annotation. Um, this inclusiveness is not supposed to be an excuse uh, to just uncritically dump all your material into a big box or data silo on some university server or cloud. Uh, uh, quite the contrary. So it's of utmost important to apply standards here uh, uh, by experts. This is just a list that might ring a bell for, for some of you. Um, okay. So this is very rough. They, at this time, uh, the right thing. So first, save digitized text and uh, documents for preservation purposes and for post-processing. Identify, make a record, create a digital uh, uh, representation. Second, um, uh, select and evaluate, canonize, if you like, or heritageize, if you need to or want to, uh, provide criteria, uh, um, if scholarly. Uh, and be explicit and transparent about these uh, criteria. Uh, and this is not enough. So we need to further develop strategy and tools that enable readers to engage in meaningful ways with this increasing amount of textual data. And this is uh, the last slide, I promise. Um, very roughly, again, what is textual heritage? Textual heritage is... Uh, the multi-dimensional, multi-layered, both and always at the same time, a material and immaterial cultural artifact. Uh, textual heritage is what you look at and how you look at it. Uh, the new category or déjà vu category uh, suits me uh, very well. It provides further justification uh, to do what I do as a digital philologist. Uh, it entitles me to apply for funding and the relevant calls for the preservation of cultural heritage. So I am biased and probably over optimistic here. Uh, at the same time, it is a commitment of the philologists to integrate uh, not only into their academic discipline, but into the wider social enterprise of memory studies, heritage studies, 
public humanities um, to engage with uh, the communities, with the people and take social responsibility and to be open, inclusive and communicative uh, in your scholarly practice. So uh, that's it, sorry for the... Okay. No, thank you very much, Franz. I think you, you perfectly uh, showed out how to add a, a, a further layer to what text is and also your your vision on textual heritage is, you, you know, we talked about it before, so I, I will stop here. So I, I, I wish to, to give space to attendees or participants that has probably some questions, also technical. Of course, you, you gave the, the, the good part of digi digitalization. So the, the advantage of the digital uh, technologies for, for philologies, for the, the bibliography and archives. So I, I guess there are comments. Also, if somebody has, yes, question for, for uh, Wayne before, I, I see Daniel Kiss raised a hand. Uh, we are hand, so please. Um, thank you, Franz, for this very inspiring talk. And um, Franz actually knows that I am a Latin textual, classical Latin textual critic. Um, so I, am engaged in what Franz termed creating an authoritative version of ancient texts by reconstructing them, creating an edition. But I actually prefer the definition of that activity provided by the great Italian scholar Gianfranco Contini that um, critical editors create working hypotheses. So we start from manuscripts and then we create, hopefully, a good acceptable uh, Edition and 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 you know unless you believe you are God you are aware aware that your edition is going to be imperfect but you hope that it's going to be a better hopefully a lot better than the previous edition um, anyhow and it's this process that I still miss in I that is still absent in this vision of digital textual studies so there are many layers many many dimensions of data but um where where does this process of reconstruction of evaluating the data take place and it still takes place in the head of the scholar and i think digital textual studies will reach maturity when we will be able to um to digitalize part of that process and i would be delighted if 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 we could speed up the slow and painstaking work of textual editing. Yeah, so I, I don't think we are in, uh, in uh, have a contrary um, positions here. So of course, uh, the uh, traditional uh, or the, the uh, textual criticism tradition here uh, has a place in, in that, that model or that, uh, that uh, idea of what textual scholarship uh, can achieve and, and should achieve. And you are a, a very humble um, uh, uh, editor and for this an excellent one maybe. Um, so of course, um, uh, critical reconstructions are a very important layer, uh, even if hypothetic. So that's, uh, that's uh, um, scholarship at, at its best, but it's not uh, uh, exclusive. So of course, it's, it's just one, one perspective on, on a textual tradition. It might be completely wrong, which is also interesting, but it, it might give us uh, clues to uh, a time that is uh, distant uh, uh, and to uh, an understanding of, of, uh, of a work that uh, um, otherwise would not be uh, um, able to be constructed. And I mean, we have stematology, for example, and this can also be supported by digital tools. So even this can be improved. Huh? And... Um, Definitely documentation has improved uh, enormously because otherwise you had to, to trust the editor and the critical apparatus and the critical apparatus in the, the least cases uh, is able to um, represent the full variance of, of textual witnesses. So my, my, these problems are known and uh, so uh, you can organize this much better in, in a digital frame, I think. You are <laughs> frowning. Thank you. Any other you know, uh, another reply, if you if you wish, or, and I, I see Vanessa is raising her hand. So please open your mic. Great, thank you so much, um, Franz, for this. I'm very interested and engaged in this aspect of of digital um, 
engagement with all these materials that we're work, working with. And um, since I'm working mostly from the oral, from the sonic, engaging with text, I feel like the actually this digital humanities is, is, is this incredible space for that. Um, one of the things that I'm wondering, as you were showing the palimpsest, and I'm wondering because um, I work with a lot of multilingual material, and um, is there any way, does, is the technology there yet for us to, for example, be able to have um, like multilingualness represented simultaneously on a digital text and together with sound? Is that, is, is that technology happening? Do, would it even, do you think that it actually would help in the interaction with this material to have the layers kind of piled one on top of the other as the user is interacting with it. Um, Cause I'm, I'm very interested actually in that, that these materials that you know we spend all this time looking at that actually they should go out into the, the large public, le, le grand public, right? And, and really that people should feel moved by their own materials, right? They, they, and these, these beauties of humanity that are kind of lost in the complexities. So is there any way that the technology is there to help us actually do this yet? I'm not sure if I, I understood completely what you want to achieve. So to, to add an, an audio level uh, layer to, 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 the, to the document that reads uh, the, the text or no? No, if we have, for example, a text that is in, for example, I have Judeo-Arabic, and then at the same time, we have a similar text in Hebrew, and we might have it in Latin, we might have it in Akkadian, and we have it in Judeo-Spanish, and we have recordings in different ones, right? How, but we also have the written texts. Could we do a, a like a kind of a digital palimpsest of course, yeah. You, you. Of course, you, you have. Then you're dealing with the structures of the work. Yeah? So the the work has a certain structure. You apply this to the various um, uh, versions or layers of of a certain text, and by making them explicit uh, uh, and um, um, processable, you can uh, navigate through various layers, always taking the same structural entry entry points. For example. Uh, and you can do this with sound as well. So audiovisual data can be annotated, can be uh, um, uh, you can can put markers at, at certain points uh, that then are connected to to the textual tradition and the the, the uh, actual document, one document or or an, another electronic text. That still seems like it's linear and like it's taking us from point A to point B and not simultaneous. Is there any way, I mean, does, there's this, um, and then I'll, I'll be quiet after this, I'm taking too oh, much time. Um, <laughs> there's, um, there's this saying in, um, in Jewish mysticism that talks about the moment of the giving of the Ten Commandments at Mount Sinai, that actually the people um, heard the visions and saw the, the, the sounds. So is, can we achieve that? Something, a version of that? I mean, I don't know. I, I would love to know myself. I, I'm definitely not the, the scholar to ask this question. That's the next, if there are any the other next work. For... So uh, it's definitely something uh, or a direction that is very, very promising. And, and we have this multimodality in the digital. So uh, definitely the book would, <laughs> wouldn't be able to achieve this. Uh, but uh, yeah, I, Maybe others. There are many possibilities yeah. uh, that that uh, uh, yeah. cover at least an but, aspect of, of this approach. Thank you very much, Franz, and I, I hope it was. Uh, maybe if there is a, a, a very quick last question. If not, maybe we. Oh, oh yeah, Wayne. Yes, please. And I'm not sure it's a quick question. First, thanks for a fantastic uh, talk. Um, I, I was thinking about uh, the idea of decanonization, which I really like, and the idea of going in kind of two directions, uh, at least, <laughs> sort of going vertically, sort of through the different layers, sort of horizontally across more different kinds of things. Uh, and, and the 
question I have is how, how to, um, if, if as you're doing that, how do you keep the sort of digital stuff alive through time af- as you're working on it? And this seems to be at some level a technical issue, but even more a kind of political and um, economic issue uh, uh, related to, and, and, and you sort of uh, mentioned it in your talk, you're happy with the idea of textual heritage because it helps you do your work. And I feel in a lot of ways it's the same way. <laughs> um, but, but how do you keep, uh, uh, keep essentially the servers running that are running the, the software that needs to display the text? Um, I mean, I know this is probably more than a short question, but I'd be... No, that's uh, definitely a very, very important existential question for the whole field. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm not in, in, in the position to give an answer. What definitely we, we need is infrastructures, uh, um, national infrastructures or uh, international, supranational infrastructures. Uh, then we have to abide to standards of, of sharing, of openness, uh, these are uh, important pieces of a, of a larger strategy, I think. Um, then the, 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 the differentiate the, 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 um, between data and presentation. Of course, we are not able to maintain presentations of fully filled with all the functionality. I press this button and then that comes up, that information, and then uh, everything is nice and understandable. So this will, will uh, break after years. So there's, there's no, no question about this. So we have to really take care about the data and cre- create infrastructures, responsibilities, standards, uh, um, so that these data can be uh, 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 exchanged and uh, presented in new ways and uh, reused. I mean, that we have the FAIR principles promoted by the European Commission, which try to uh, uh, address this issue, to, to, uh, to take care of data in a way that it can survive. And then, of course, uh, at the end, it's always a question of money, resources, and political decisions. Uh, and we have to have a strong voice here, probably. So that's as, as activists for uh, textual heritage, we, we have to tell maybe the, the decision makers what is uh, necessary to uh, ensure that uh, what we create as representations or knowledge about uh, or uh, what we try to preserve uh, can be preserved over time in, in the digital medium because it is uh, um, dangerous and not safe. It's not a safe place. Yeah. Yes, I, I think that, sorry, heritage at least has this value. I mean, it, it sounds good at politics and it works, I think, as as a, a, a keyword to, to get uh, financed and, and so. So I'm sorry to, to, to stop you, but I think we really need at least five minutes of, of break. And then, so we start at uh, three and five o'clock with our round table and open discussion. I hope in a quite relaxed mood. So you, you can go on having your tea or coffee during the, the round table. It's perfectly uh, reasonable for us. So. Uh, see you in five minutes. Thank you very much, Franz. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome back, everybody. We were just in a in a breakout room just for a moment, and some of the topics that came up already were very appropriate for our general discussion. So we hope we can. Uh, move on to a more open moment. Um, We hope you had a chance to stretch your legs, take a short screen break. Um, Here it's sunny in the Netherlands, so it's also a a break in the sun for for once. Um, Thank you for being with us. We know that in some parts of the world it's late, so thank you for staying until the end. Um, I'm just going to give a few coordinates in terms of how we thought um, we should structure this this uh, roundtable. Well, although to, to take a leaf from uh, from the idea of uh, of uh, decanonizing, we also want to destructure it a bit in this moment. Um, so we have actually we have prepared a few questions for our keynote speakers, but uh, during the symposium we realized that so many more interesting topics and questions naturally came up 
that we decided not to inflict our own questions upon you, uh, for now at least. <laughs> Uh, rather than doing that, we would like to, to split the roundtable in, into two parts, basically. So first, we would like to ask our two keynote speakers to take maybe between five and ten minutes each um, to address the symposium as a whole, um, whatever theme, whatever thread they would like to, to comment upon. Um, so we are in a sort of play-by-ear mode to some extent. Um, still, we would like to keep as kind of uh, on the background, we would like to keep this big question, which we used for the, as the title for our roundtable, do we actually need textual heritage? Maybe you could address that question to some extent. And I would add one more question to that, which is what can we do with this notion of textual heritage, just as a kind of very general, very broad um, yeah, question. The second part of the roundtable then will be an open conversation with all of the speakers and all of the attendees. So we encourage all of you to put your questions in the chat if you would like, and we will try to manage um, to moderate as best as, as best as we can. So for now, I'm very happy, particularly happy to welcome again Professor Deneke Vipke, since we decided to, to go on, on a first name basis. I have to force myself to do that. <laughs> So if you could please uh, uh, start by offering your own impressions. Um, again, we, we're happy with five, 10 minutes or so, up to you. Um, and thank you again for kicking off the, the symposium and now bringing all back together. <laughs> I know it's quite a lot to ask of you, but thank you so much. Thank you so much, Andrea. I don't think I can really bring it all together, <laughs> but I think we'll all try and I particularly look forward to uh, talking with a lot of you. So I would suggest for this uh, final session where really we would like to talk, to have as many voices as possible in our virtual space here, that those of you who can actually kind of turn on your cameras because that will kind of facilitate uh, the discussion. But I understand of course also if you can, or um, you know, under the circumstances. But you know, first of all, thank you again for doing this incredibly exciting uh, uh, and very ch kind of challenging um, symposium. Uh, uh, this we really need more of those kind of uh, occasions. I think to to talk not just across disciplines but also trans academically in some way. Um, so I would actually like to mostly put out questions <laughs> and hear back from our contributors and also from the broader audience, because there are so many things really to struggle with here. So in that sense, I have more questions in some ways and some comments on, on, um, on actually questions that Andrea put out um, and also Eduardo. Um, uh, and the second point is that I also really want to think as about, that's what Andrea just said, to think about what can we do now with it? I think that's very, very important. It's not, not just an analytic category, what can we really do with it? Um, uh, from our different vantage points, no? So this whole question of how do you define a text, you know, and textual heritage, I think especially Fran's presentation uh, was really terrific in kind of really going ahead and defining it with a text wheel and that is so rich. And that shows us a lot, I think, what could be brought, you know, into uh, historiographies of basically all humanities disciplines, no? Um, I really felt like that was very, very uh, powerful. and. I want to take a sidestep here a little bit. I talked a lot about what can textual heritage actually add. Now I want to actually extend that to family similarities. Now we talked yesterday about linguistic heritage. Now uh, we can talk about literary heritage and so on. Are there other types of heritage? Then there's documentary heritage, you know, as an authorized discourse. What to make of all of that? Do we need all of that? Uh, should we use this more like in vernacular ways rather than really defining it too much um, in some way? And I think uh, from my perspective, so I would like to hear from you about that. What are other types of heritage that also have to do with language uh, and text to some degree? Um, so the, the one thing uh, that I put tracked about textual heritage, and I like that in the last uh, discussion, actually, we talked a lot about how it might be convenient for the work we are doing, no? is that really it broadens the notions of textualities. Now, if you take literary heritage, you have the Storny 
question of what is actually literature and our notion of literature is so anachronistic when we look back into the past now and this is precisely where you know Franz's description of decanonization and deselection is so incredibly helpful you know where we can then kind of recanonize and rethink about what did it mean in whatever period we are looking at now um so um uh, in that sense interestingly i think um some of the things that that um, textual heritage can bring us is not necessarily so much the text, but it's more the heritage angle. Uh, <clears throat> namely, really the idea that we look at texts that, for example, were heavily canonized all of a sudden as heritage. And I want to give you one example here that I've been working with a lot uh, since I recently became the gen general editor of the so-called Chutang uh, Library of Catholic and Chinese Literature, very much on the model of the Loeb, which was established 100 years ago with bilingual translations in English and facing Latin and Greek. And really this idea that Catholic Chinese died as a regional lingua franca in the 20th century. And now we have this kind of heritage that we really want to bring out there. And where I think that Siri more scholarly in the sense that they are looking at more literal translation and making, you know, um, uh, bringing this literature, you know, more into uh, scholarly spaces uh, where we want to really straddle things from a heritage angle in the sense of obviously these need to be translations that are scholarly very sound. But this is also kind of a heritage that where we want to actually really uh, along the line of uh, producing something that has fidelity, not just literalness, you know, obviousness, but really bringing that out there that is actually text to enjoy, text to kind of take into the creative process of future poetry, just in the way as classical Chinese poetry and Japanese poetry was inspiring to generations like Ezra Pound and so on, and then kind of dropped off more into a scholarly business. Now, uh, so I think that is very important. The heritage angle is about actually enjoying text. And Franz said, you know, I'm a custodian of text also to enjoy some. I think that's that's very important. And uh, now, so on this on this question, really, what is textual heritage? Why textual heritage? What kind of other heritages are there? I want to ask actually David very specifically, what does textual heritage actually do for heritage studies? Because I really want to understand that. Is that actually, I mean, it might be really great for us humanists, but, but for, what about textual heritage studies? So that's question number one. The second question is that I, I find like one of the most fascinating things about this symposium was how people came out about what their deepest motivations are actually for pursuing the kind of research, the case studies we have seen, both academic, both very personal. And there was a lot of language that was very emotional about life, about, you know, uh, objects of orality. I don't know, sonic traces. I have a whole list of wonderful formulations. Um, and I, I would love to hear more about what is your motivation there? I mean, obviously we had now to uh, something more about uh, really documentation. How do we document that so that actually we transmit it? No, is this actually doing heritage in the very literal sense? Um, but then there's also the question of how to really produce knowledge out of that. That's something I'm very interested in too, in terms of how to re relate it then to forms of historiography. Um, and in that context, one thing I'm very uh, kind of nervous about always when you talk about decanonization and having all these wonderful digital uh, materials is really this danger of, after all, we are just one person with one life with so much time on our hands to do these things. It's wonderful to have all that stuff, but how can we really digest that and make it useful and produce, you know, scholarship or even public humanities out of that? And I wonder with the tools we have now, you know, isn't there some kind of a danger of we want to have that ultimate knowledge or reality simulation, a yearning for really reconstructing and keeping it all that then comes kind of is, is very much uh, that's the dilemma also that was talked about now uh, in terms of what, we, what do we really do with that now uh, the question of eliminating white noise of still making actually meaningful statements about all those materials now it's very crucial when you think about knowledge production. And I think that's why sometimes with digital projects that are mostly documentary, I always immediately ask like, okay, what do we do with this then really? You no, know? how can we really digest that? Um, then the, th so that's really about the deeper motivations. I would really love to hear from you. The third question, and I'll keep it short here, um, is, and this is a little bit more putting my motivation out there, really this question of, 
where's the past now in our presentist age, no? As activists of the past, as activists perhaps of textual heritage or some form of heritage, no? Uh, where where is that now and how can we really bring, I was thinking about this with each presentation, each of these case studies, how can we bring this into history? And as I said, it doesn't mean the history of the literature of, you know, the history of Spanish literature, uh, as was mentioned in one of the, the, the presentations that all of a sudden you get these songs from Morocco, you know, showing up there. But still, I mean, I'm, I'm wondering, David, you, you, your narrative about Dartmoor now, what is the relationship to other textual heritage at the time that are, might be very hierarchical no? in terms of elite and more popular and so on? How can you bring this into historiography? You said you didn't like history with an age, but I do feel like if we want to be kind of really activists for the past, no? we should in integrate that in some kind of a way. No? Um, or for example, you know, Vanessa's uh, songbooks, where to bring that into historiographies, where to really bring this to a more global kind of less local stage somehow, no? Uh, or Steve Nelson, I also really felt like, oh my God, we need a wonderful history of Japanese and East Asian music, no? In some ways that really goes into the entry. And I see Andrea and Steve smile, uh, Stephen uh, smiling. I wait for that because we need that knowledge. We literary scholars to understand things and it's so highly specialized. How do you bring this into a historiography of that kind of music, of that heritage that is so undervalued, I think, in the study no, of East Asian cultures? So that's actually, you know, my motivation on the one hand, you know, where's the past now, how to relate to historiographies, but I also wonder about each of the case studies we heard, no? Uh, and then just to really quickly wrap up, I have so much else here about comparatively, theorizing the heritization process. I'll just leave that about the intangible and so on. Let's actually wrap up with two more, two more questions. So question number five here is uh, the question of trans-academic collaboration. As way there are a lot of hard boundaries. Some of them have to do with uh, academic uh, kind of convictions. Some of them are just bounded by the limits we have on time no? <laughs> in space, in our own lives. But I wonder what can we, how can we strategize here now about how to leverage conversations? And in my presentation, just to go back to that, uh, I was actually the only one, uh, and, and I, unfortunately I missed the first presentation this morning due to personal circumstances, I apologize for that, but talking about documentary heritage, now UNESCO. And I think there is some kind of really very uncomfortable relationship between AHD, these authorized discourses and critical heritage studies but for my example, really, of these Chosen and of these Korean and Japanese missions, I found it was incredibly inspiring to see the framing, you know, of some of these document this documentary heritage. And how can we do better on the Wiki Wikipedia pages <clears throat> about these missions? Only the German page and the Korean one mentions that actually these some of these documents have become cultural, you know, uh, memory, of, which I think is really a shame. I mean, how can that not be there when you write historically about it? I think. It's a testimony to those hard boundaries and we need to do something about that, no? So we, how can we change the mindset? How can we change our conversations, no? And then the last point is about the ethos, no? Which I think, uh, you know, I brought up in my talk, but also really echoed throughout presentations. How can we help communities? How can we kind of help even, you can say a, a text with many variants is also almost a community, you know? How can you produce that perfect thing out of it? Um, some of this can also be really very much about act, being activists for the past in a present age where we have to be really fight for funding, um, you know, uh, against very present oriented uh, research. Some of it really has to do with hard problems, no? Doing East Asia now, East Asian heritage in a, in a time, you know, with all these tensions, there is really a lot we can do. Stephen talked about the Chinese scholars looking at Japanese music, trying to find their own music in that, of course, not looking at performance practices now, no? How can you talk to these people? How can we actually create a dialogue there and create more reconciliation and be in that sense, the best possible activist for the past, but also for heritage or textual heritage. I'll leave it at that. I'm really sorry, so many things I couldn't bring up, uh, but I very much look forward to hearing from you. Thank you so very much, so many things. And it's almost impossible for me to moderate, so I won't even try to, to moderate the, the discussion. I will just um, pick up on your first question and ask Professor Harvey David 
if you would like to to start from there. So the first question was, what does it what does the notion of textual heritage do for heritage studies specifically? We know that we again we are cornering you a bit into that um, role that you can es escape from, obviously, if you want. But um, definitely, this is a question that we ourselves, myself and Eduardo, wanted to pose. So it's it's a perfect place to begin, I think. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, it comes up again. The, the questions that uh, Andrea and Eduardo asked before includes the sort of what kind of, you know, are texts more like monuments or, mon or, or more like performances or neither? And as sort of what does how does the study of text transform the ways of studying heritage, what, which, which echoes the, the question Vibke Denica asked in terms of, so what does text do for heritage studies and things like that? Um, I mean, first of all, I like the idea of playing it by ear to echo something said earlier. And in terms of the simple, I, I sort of start off by thinking this simple, this simple question, do we need textual heritage? And, I don't, and I'd, I, I'll explain, but I sort of think, well, not necessarily, but it's useful. And I can see that on a sort of pragmatic level I guess, responding to Franz's comments about, you know, it helps get funding, why not? And there's a sort of practical level to that, but there's, a, there's also a set of intellectual um, advantages, I think, in terms of echoing again, Vibka's ideas about broadening notions of textuality. Uh, perhaps the heritage side of things is, a, is a, uh, I don't know, I think, try to think sometimes uh, points towards it, perhaps more humble, Toward points towards this, the issues about authorship and the, this sort of the right to narrate, and that itself asks some sometimes some some uh, quite difficult questions and sort of challenges responsibilities about this as well. In terms of uh, particularly, if you think today, I mean, you've had a lot of discussion this afternoon about the uh, about uh, digital humanities and a sort of it's something that if you read any newspaper at the moment, the role of social media in the world at the moment is is uh, absolutely current and is a is a really difficult challenge is how one how one uh, manages these sorts of issues i guess the my central answer i suppose i'm looking at down on my list here in terms of how, you know the study of how to study of text so what does textual heritage do for heritage studies i guess it makes much more transparent for me at least and again i try to steer, steer clear sometimes i'm not a heritage studies scholar i'm a geographer but that's that's a that's another i know i, I can see i'm playing the role of the heritage studies person here i'm absolutely fine with that so uh, i guess it makes more transparent and clear the means through which to focus on ideas about uh, mobility i guess we've heard a lot about mobility and movement a lot in the different papers of the last few the last few days the points towards issues about circulation the circulation of ideas of people of meanings of knowledge and of skill and i guess by saying that i'm also uh, highlighting the fact that i I'm, i am seeing these things both as the heritage studies person but also the geographer in terms of emphasizing that importance of geographer the geography the, the the need to locate stuff uh, spatially as well as temporally uh, but perhaps also linguistically thinking about Isabel's paper earlier on as well in this sort of in, the, in this in this thing. Um, the, another side that I think really comes out as here is I, I've just written down a note about skill. There's something about skill here. And for me, one of the really fascinating elements of, the, you know, of my experiences over the last couple of days is just how ideas of skill, creative practice, whether that be about translation or about musicality or about dance, how important these things are, uh, whether you know, passed on in different ways and learnt or enhanced in concert with scholarship in a way that the two can't be separated, this sense of conversation again, and in a creative, a productive conversation. Um, in terms of the, 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 something that I think comes a lot from this, which again is, uh, well, Vibka is really pointing to it several times in different ways about the, where is the past and our presentist age and, a space for activism and so on is the poli the politics of this and the political political implications um and i, I you know that uh, i you know i think that heritage seems to be so central to so many experiences and developments of that are going on at the moment um and there's a lot whether and there's a lot of this can focus on monuments and toppling monuments and things like that but i think her you know textual heritage can really help this uh, help with this uh, with this thinking. You, know, the, you could th think about the monument is clearly a text, and as a site of performance and so on. 
Um, and I think bringing that textual heritage element in makes it much more open than it being a, a lump of stone or bronze or something. And maybe this is where this, the, this broadening out ideas of texts and bringing in this idea about dia the dialogical, uh, com you know, the conversational form, I suppose, from and the you know, ideas about sto you know, the text as stone and, and bodily, archaeological sites, dance, music, sound, landscape, poetry and performance in different ways. Uh, and the conversation between scholarship and practice, the textual, the linguistic, the tangible and intangible. Um, I find all that, you know, this coming, coming through very strongly. Uh, I've got a little note here about the, the between you know, the, the, the hidden work, the, I suppose, hidden marginalia, the quotidian, the from below, if you like, and uh, that elite, uh, you know, the, the canon, if you want, or the big H history writing. I've also got a note here about serendipity, which in a way comes through Wayne's paper, I thought, in the sort of the accidental, or is it accidental, uh, uh, in prominence of the 1970s facsimile, which may have turned out to be the original, original anyway. I thought that was a fascinating paper around, you know, sort of tracing these, this, that story, which is not a simple uh, chronological story. And I think that the, 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 the idea of textual her heritage allows us to uncover that in a much more interesting way, I think. Um, so yeah, conversation, uh, what have I got, what else have I got to you? You have different, uh, uh, different linguistic fields. Um, it, something else that came through, I just noted it down very quickly at the end, it, it, uh, which, uh, uh, comes to quite, quite strongly in Franz's paper at the end about it, this, this idea about inheritance, and maybe this does speak to Vibka's ideas she's talking about, about uh, um, the, where's the past and the presentist age, is the sense in which you know, thinking about inheritance and, and responsibility and that pointing towards the future uh, in Franz's talk, sort of just coming through right at the end, actually, the sort of the, that... Uh, we have a responsibility and this, rather than thinking about the where, where's the past and the present is, what are we doing it for? And that turns one's eyes from looking at the past very much towards looking to the future, that sense of purpose and so on. Um, and I you know, don't quite know where to go with that, but I think it's always, in, it's, it's, it's always too easy to ignore that future, future making sense of, of that, her, that heritage sometimes brings to these sorts of things. Um, so yeah, I'd say, Textual heritage, it might not be necessary, but I think it's really useful, even if it's just a pragmatic, practical use for, for, for us at the, the present. If people find it useful, then that's fine. Uh, from a personal perspective, I've, I, you know, I've felt that it's really allowed, I mean, just in a, to slightly, um, you know, as a personal note over the last few days, I found it has allowed me in a, an extremely nourishing and jo an enjoyable experience for me uh, as a, a window or a way into looking towards largely East Asian and, and South Asian literature and art and history that I, I would never have been possible. This is way outside my normal comfort zone of, of uh, what I tend to do research on. And so that's the, this language has provided me a way in and a, and a really enjoyable time uh, and, a, and a, allowed a conversation to take place that I've, I've, I've certainly found I've been fully able to take part in a, as, a, as a full member of this group of people. And so that's great from my perspective. So uh, yeah, thank you very much for asking me along and to be the heritage scholar, that's fine. Thank you so very much. So I think in a way we could say that we're sort of doing the work of translation that Isabel was talking about in her presentation today and also characterizing that figure of the translator as something so different from, from what we could imagine from a textualist kind of imagination, old fashioned, conceived in an old fashioned way. But I don't want to, to take away any more time from other people's questions. I see that uh, Michael Watson has uh, his hand raised. Should I, can I ask you to unmute yourself if you want? Uh, to ask the question directly. I'm sorry, that was a mistake. <laughs> oh, I see. Never mind. Uh, Eduardo, would you like to add any comments yourself? I have a few. I, I did like, if I can just say one thing and then... Go on, go on, go on. Well, I'm also wondering, I think I put a, we put a lot of questions out there for people to answer, no? 
whether we could go off on that, I wonder, uh, so that everybody has a chance to kind of think about that or even like offer like uh, th their own personal experience over these three, uh, three yeah. days. For, and for the shy, uh, yeah. you, you may I, use also the chat if you are shy to, to talk English. But since there was always so little time for discussion in so many, with such a rich program, now that's a great, great opportunity. So let's see if silence is more generative on my part, if, if I can just, uh, if it does something good for us. I think I'll jump in with uh, what uh, Vicky was saying about, you know, the songbooks are so local and it's like every single one of us have a very local thing, but how can we bring it out? And I think that that is um, because in every single one of these, there are these threads that are part of uh, maybe archetypes of the way that we engage with either sound or text or movement or space or, or the crisscrossing of all with each other. So how is there some kind of theoretical step up that we can make to actually move out of the the ultra hyper specificity and be able to have these conversations david like you were saying like it's the first time that i've like looked at i don't know the, the french symbolist poetry in japan i never even thought i didn't even know that that existed right so i mean so this is how do we how do we go up a level? And that's, I mean, that's really when it gets really interesting. So, um, so I'm wondering if, if people have any suggestions of how we do that. I mean, I think that if in our own very specific work, we kind of come up with that higher layer, then maybe we can all connect on that higher layer, but any, anything else? Uh, I'm not sure about uh, one of the things that your comment, uh, Vanessa, has me thinking a lot about uh, is um, one of Vemke's nice terms, uh, trans academic. Um, and uh, I like that a lot. <laughs> uh, and, it, and it seems to be a kind of central uh, opportunity and challenge kind of at the same time. Uh, because I think to kind of go up and go out or go in a direction where we can find a different plane on which to sort of connect, um, uh, we, we probably have to think carefully about um, how we can get out of our own sort of academic silos, <laughs> our disciplines, our institutions, and the way that they formulate what counts as important. Um, I know from sort of personal experience, having been involved uh, in sort of heritage projects, like I said, sort of not really knowing I was involved in a heritage project as a graduate student trying to figure out what the text meant and how it was copied and all these sorts of things. I was almost kind of oblivious to the fact that there were all these politics going on around me. <laughs> um, and that oftentimes um, other broader communities beyond academia uh, were much more interested in kind of the takeaway as opposed to the process of finding kind of these documents and uh, you know the idea that, that the facsimile was actually more widely used and perhaps even more important than say the quote original text that that was going nowhere <laughs> sort of uh, and so maybe one way to think about how to sort of go up uh, a level uh, is to think about uh, this term uh, trans academic um, and what how we might practice that I mean, what does it mean to sort of go across academic disciplines, but even more than that, sort of try and engage uh, with um, world heritage projects? I mean, um, how do we get involved with UNESCO? Do we want to get involved with UNESCO? <laughs> um, does that sort of accelerate our academic careers or pull them back? I think these are some of the key things that we might be thinking about, um, the sort of ways to what elevate <laughs> um, and find connections at different levels. I talk a little. Um, I was the first speaker after uh, 
Wiebke's um, wonderful introduction. And I found uh, that I would really uh, thought of things in a much too narrow way. Um, I went back to something I did uh, more than um, 12, 13 years ago uh, and thought of um, textual heritage within uh, musical performance practice um, and what the text meant to the to the people who were using it and writing trying to write down their their musical practice um, since that time since 2008 i've i've gone in a larger a, a big circle and done a lot of other things that actually might have been better for me to talk about this time um, i'm a music historian but at the same time, I am involved here in Japan with uh, many uh, different, um, let me say, literary societies. Um, of course, medieval literature, um, early medieval literature, that is uh, the Genji, the tale of Genji, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Buddhist literature, but also a field that's called Setsua, which is narrative tales, narrative tales about all sorts of fields. And in this, um, this field of uh, narrative tales about music, we have all of these wonderful tales about, um, how should I say it? Um, narrative tales that, that grew out of a, a particular historical event or that um, were born to explain a historical event that actually never occurred. Um, so uh, to, 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 to to build myths or create new legends about the origins of certain types of music and things. And as I, as I was looking at all of these, I, I was looking back a thousand years ago and thinking, what was the most important music at that time? Um, what were these, what were the people so excitedly writing about? Uh, I need to get this music back to life in a way. And I tried to do it with a big ensemble, um, Chinese music, a trans for, Trans transferred to Japan, and I did um, a big concert that cost me a lot of money. It cost uh, me a lot of grant money, but it also cost me a lot of money personally. And I thought, I can't keep this up. Um, there's no way I can sustain that. So I thought, well, now what I will do now is work on solo music, music that I can play myself or music that I, that I can get one person to play. And there's this wonderful body of tales about uh, solo music for the biwa, the lute, the secret pieces of the lute repertoire. So I thought, okay, let's, let's put together a project for, of that. So um, we have all of the notations. Uh, th the problem is with music notation is that um, people who work in the field of literature are allergic to music. They don't want to look at the notations. They won't look at the notations because they know they have this, this idea that they won't be able to read it anyhow. Uh, so all of the annotations about music in all of the um, modern editions of the ancient medieval texts are wrong. They get everything wrong because they don't bother to look. Um, so for the last 10 years, I've been struggling uh, with that sort of problem, for one thing. I've also got involved with musicians um, to try and get this repertoire back to life, to give them something to play um, that um, it may not be exactly what was being played at the time, but we can, we can work our ways through um, the notations and accounts about um, how people uh, heard the music. Um, and then at, at, well, when I was doing that, I discovered that there was this very, very important text that hadn't been put into a proper edition yet. So at the moment, I'm in, involved with producing a proper edition, proper annotated edition, edition of a manual about playing the biwa that was written in the early 13th century and producing a, a, a modern Japanese translation of it so that people can uh, read it, uh, the, the literary people can read it. So I've gone about this great big circle, um, trying to get the musicians involved and trying to get make this modern edition, which will be easy for the literary people to read. I should have talked about this. This is what I should have talked about in my presentation. Um, I'm sorry that I didn't. I had this very narrow, narrow idea of uh, textual heritage probably because because of my uh, misunderstanding of uh, what textual was meaning in this context. I must apologize in those terms. <laughs> That's it from me, I think. <laughs>
No need to apologize. This was wonderful to hear as a supplement. <laughs> Absolutely. I was totally enthralled. I All this stuff I didn't know. And I commiserated also with the idea that I study a genre known as Shijo, which has got musical roots that are basically chopped off most of the time. Uh, they became kind of literary texts in the early 20th century. So um, uh, no, please, no apologies, please. That was really fantastic. <laughs> I, I think I saw a hand, perhaps Heidi. Otherwise, I know somebody else also has a question. Oh, sorry, we cannot hear you yet. Can you, could you? Okay. Yes, I, I raised my hand some minutes ago. Um, well, um, I, I just wanted to add that because it seemed to, Perhaps at the end of my talk yesterday, um, I seem to be more critical that uh, it probably meant to be. Um, in fact, I, I, I do um, know that this, in, in fact, we have a benefit from the textual heritage, at least um, if we uh, ask what can be the limits of textual heritage. So for me, it, uh, I am supposed to study the material and I always ask myself, um, well, where's the text and where's the material? And, and, and of course, I, I, I always um, am supposed to study the material and then again ending up with studying the text. So um, at the same time um, that I, I, at the same time that we can say it's fruitful, um, just if we also uh, know where, where the limits of this uh, concept are. There is one more question from the, I think from Roberta Stripoli, I, if she wants to. Um, yes, um, can you hear me? Yes, okay. Um, I have a question about myself. Uh, so, uh, meaning, uh, well, first of all, I apologize because I could only see a portion of the talks um, since, um, it's morning in North America. And <laughs> also there is AAS going on at the same time as, as you probably know. Um, but but I, I'm really interested in this um, um, textual heritage idea. And um, in my personal work, I mean, the, the research I am doing now, as some of you know, is uh, in a way similar uh, to, to the, the, the one uh, uh, th described by David Harvey's. Um, I go to um, places that, are, that have legends related to the tale of the Heike, and uh, I uh, excavate these narratives um, together with uh, um, local uh, like monuments and uh, uh, also put them in relationship with their source, which is usually the tale of the Heike and no theater. Um, and my idea is to, again, put everything together, like the text and the monuments, with, the monuments being the graves, uh, Yashikiato, like the place in which someone's house once stood, uh, including people who never existed and, mm -hmm. and so on. So, so putting together all these things and, and uh, which is quite interdisciplinary and I'm basically a literature like scholar. <laughs> so, so, but this involves history, involves archeology span and, and various other uh, fields. And then also connect the places if the various places of Japan related to the same narrative. For example, in my book on the story of Gyo, I talk about four graves that the dancer Gyo had in different parts of Japan. And this is a bit different from what local like historians do because the local historians, they study the local monument, but they are not really interested in similar monuments that exist in other parts of Japan, for example. So do I, should I say from now on that I am doing textual heritage? <laughs> like, this is cool. Yes, please. <laughs> um, or, I mean, is textual heritage connected with this way of like being interdisciplinary, to, of putting together narratives from, from different places, mixing history with capital H and 
and like these local narratives that are often known only like to local historians. So is this is this part of what you guys are talking about when you say uh, textual heritage? Thank you very much. Thank you to you, Roberta. I, I have to add that uh, Roberta Stupoli is maybe the, the, the only one uh, scholar of Japanese literature that used the word cultural heritage for the title of her book, so I don't know any other. Uh, and, and so, yes, you have, I, I give you the permission to use textual heritage to <laughs> describe your, your work. I, I think it's a perfect, uh, a perfect example of that. Um, I don't know if somebody wants to I think, I think it's, it's, again, it emphasizes the interdisciplinarity and, it, and, uh, and in some ways is we're, without a stake, you know, I don't feel that people are treading on each other's toes when they, when they refer to these. So sometimes people are a bit afraid about it, but I think it's quite a positive space of dis interdisciplinary space. Um, I mean, I, I go back, I suppose, to the question again about what does textual heritage do for heritage studies? My own background as a, as a, in, my, the degree program I'm very much involved, involved in in Denmark is, uh, was originally set up by archaeology department and it was very much seen as this, uh, uh, well, we need, a, we, need, we need a heritage studies degree in order to look after the stuff that archaeologists are digging up. And it's very much, uh, we, you know, the archaeologists dig up, the, dig up important artifacts and then we need some heritage studies people to, to like, look after it. And when they, when I came along, and they sort of you know, employed me and said, "Well, this is what we're going to do for our programs. And this is what we, it was a bit sort of, oh, that's a bit, a bit strange. You don't, you don't, you know." So um, you, you count it, you count heritage as a little bit more than just art, you know, artifacts being dug up by us archaeologists. And yes, I do. And it was a bit of a puzzlement, really. And and it, but it's been, yeah, you know, it's been a good conversation. But in some ways, you know, talking to the world of literature, literary studies. And uh, it, uh, and art history and so on. There's a there's a lot more. I'd say there's a lot more openness and common ground right away in terms of that. that I suppose processual or idea of intertextuality and so on that can allow a conversation much more. I'd say much more easily than it sometimes has with archaeologists who uh, often will see themselves and often from the outside will be seen as more closely related to heritage studies than people doing art history, for instance. But I think, I think the match is a lot better. Thank you. No, I, I think we, I, I, at least me and Andrea, are, we are not trying to, to create a new discipline, uh, but maybe more a, a, a new inter area, a area of inter inquiry where nobody has at each, you know, it's everybody's out of their comfort zone. So maybe we can, it's hard, to, to, to explain uh, your own research sometimes, but it probably we, we can yeah, find a, a, a space for everybody. I don't Maybe know Vipke had a oh. reaction, I think. Yes. yes, thank you so much. Although I didn't want to speak so much more, but you know, thank you so much for sharing this. I would of course not dare to answer your question about yourself, but I find it amazing that this triggers so much soul searching in terms of, okay, what am I actually doing? And I can very much relate, I mean, in other areas of constantly thinking like, what am I actually doing? Developing your own GPS now for your passions, for your interests and so on, where they take you. So, um, I mean, I do feel as much as I'm myself kind of still textual heritage, other types of heritages and what, what, what role that they play and what they can do. Um, I, st I do think they might provide a really interesting way for you to think about what you're doing. And in the sense, and, and you know, for two reasons, um, I think one of the things that literary studies, especially in the older type, that's more uh, focused on unique textual documents that might be canonized or perhaps even not so canonized, but more unique, it's not doing very well as dealing with repetition, reperformance, redoing. <laughs> And I think the heritage aspect is exactly that. And that came out in so many papers now. Heritage is about something that you somehow redo. You translate it into a different medium. You might have dance translated into a heike, which is then performed, which is then, you know, going back to monuments that exist in local places, no? Where you could almost say like all these echoes in tangible and intangible forms, no? Are reperformances, redoings of this. And you're kind of trying to see, it's almost like a polyphonic, polymedial <laughs> kind of, uh, you know, matrix where you try to kind of figure that out, uh, coming out of literary studies, no? And I think that adds 
you know, looking at that, I feel that for myself, looking at this envoy poetry that I talked about a couple of days ago, that a lot of literary scholars would say like, well, that's not so interesting poetry because it's so much reperformed of similar tropes of friendship or, you know, common, common heritage, East Asian heritage, all kinds of things. But it's actually, we are interested in those reperformances because there are a lot of subtleties of change, of variance, of all of that, no? And that puts a very different focus so in that sense, I do think, I mean, as much as I don't dare to answer your question, that textual heritage here could be something interesting. It links to a great uh, concept that Wayne brought up, the contextual, the sense that once we have a text and we, you know, once we as text-focused scholars have a text object, no, to go back to the text wheel, it unfolds a different kind of dynamic when we go into the context, no? Where does it come from? Where is it reperformed? Is it translated into other media languages? All kinds of things. And that different agency of actually telling that story, not because we are focused on the printed text, but all of a sudden going through all these contexts, no? That textuality kind of throws into us into if it's very material, no? I think that's, that appears to me really the incredible surplus. I'll stop here. No, thank you. I mean, it's always, inspiring I, I i i may say yeah recreation of heritage i mean is is heritage you, you can't do heritageization with, without using and recreating the past so i, I think that's just the point it's a very obvious thing in in heritage studies so uh, there are any other questions yeah wayne and france maybe no yes um uh, so let's go wayne before yeah uh, I was just hoping to hear a little bit more from Isabel, um, uh, sort of following up a little bit on what uh, WebKit was saying about reproductions um, as, uh, and, and especially how translation creates copies and reproductions, right? And how those um, might formulate uh, a really useful way for thinking about um, uh, cultural heritage. And uh, I have some sort of personal motivations because uh, we'd have been, like I was mentioning, um, uh, was uh, quite important to Kim Ok, who was the teacher of the poet that I talked a lot about. Uh, and he, uh, the, the poet that I've studied a lot, this guy Kim Sawal, was really invested in French symbolist poetry to a certain degree. Uh, he was really invested uh, in Arthur Simons. Uh, in fact, there are sort of notes about how he lent his teacher Arthur Simons translations of French symbolist poetry and so on and so forth. So this idea of translation as a way to think about repetition, uh, repetition and reproduction um, as heritage, that goes across sort of cultural boundaries um, and heritage is sort of spreading across, across cultural boundaries. This seems to be an interesting thing you were talking a lot about. I'd love to hear more. Yes, thank you. And I couldn't really put it better than you just have. Uh, I, I really agree that with also what Professor Deneke was just saying and um, Eduardo about this idea of repetition that has actually a, a lot of creative value in, in art in general, but especially in literature. And, and when we look at um, Asian literature, I don't know much about Korea, but what you just said about the poet in Korea being inspired by Arthur Simmons and symbolism is really fascinating because it shows that these texts and these aesthetic, they don't stop giving and inspiring um, other people in other forms. And uh, if you look at Japanese literature, actually many canonical texts, I'm thinking for instance about the short stories of Akutagawa, uh, but also Dazai Osamu and all these famous uh, writers, they are actually just, just a retelling of previous texts, rewritten -re texts, uh, Chinese texts sometimes, but also European texts and etc. And um, I feel in, in Japan, maybe in Asia, there's much less of a taboo around this, around the fact that creativity is never actually uh, a unique individual just creating from nowhere, right? It's always recycling, reusing, retelling. Um, also the idea that the author is never alone and he's always in a constant dialogue with the previous authors and also with, uh, for instance, the authors of the text he's translating, or sometimes also um, Japanese authors that I'm studying, someone like Kaobate Asnari, for instance, they wouldn't hide the fact that they're working uh, with what we would call ghost writers or people preparing texts for them and often actually preparing translation that are later magnified. Um, so yes, there's a lot of uh, 
I think, things to learn from the practice of translation, but used in a wide way, not translation just to um, be faithful to a source text or to uh, uh, let a new audience know about the source text, but really translation as a creative form. And again, in, in, um, in Japan, there's this, um, this notion of hong-an, which is supposedly less strict uh, literal translation than honyaku, which is the word we use today for honyaku, uh, which is more about uh, maybe translated as rewriting or retelling. Um, and something that Professor Deneko was saying about uh, heritage as pleasure and text that we enjoy, I think there's a link maybe here. These texts are translated, retold, uh, rewritten because they procure pleasure to many readerships and audiences and we want to keep hearing about them. Thank you very much. And yeah, I think that there was France uh, before. I don't know if it's connected to this, but uh, Yeah, of course, it's, uh, everything is connected. <laughs> I think, uh, yeah, where to start? So um, in general, the, the concept of the textual heritage, so uh, it brings us together, which is very useful. So I enjoyed it very much. It gave me a lot of input and ways to connect to other people thinking and work and evaluating things. So that's uh, that's a useful point. The next would be, so I'm always working on a, a methodological level as a digital humanist. I'm very much interdisciplinary work. And so to share methods as a textual heritage scholar, I think that's very useful. So I'm, I'm, I'm a specialist for digital editions to create representation. So a small field, uh, so medieval Latin, but uh, so there are methods that can um, be beneficial also to the work of others and problems that are solved here can be solved in, in other disciplines as well. So that's that's also important. So to, to share uh, methods uh, um, uh, in an interdisciplinary way. So for this, it's, it's still, again, a useful thing. But then most important and most specific to textual heritage is the heritage thing. Um, so to, to share practices to, uh, of, of engagement, to connect to the people. So because, I mean, heritage is something, so I always think of, of uh, so in two ways, someone who is knocking at your door, uh, here um, you, you inherited something. Um, uh, it's uh, so probably not one million dollars that you can spend immediately on the things you like, but it's a house or something, uh, a box, and you. So, so it, it, this is yours. So we we are the the, the, the people who are knocking on people's door and say, yeah, this is something you inherited. So uh, how how to help the people's deal with this or, or making them appreciate the other thing is what what Heidi. Uh, uh, does or did is to knock on other people so, and ask them for their heritage. So, uh, what is there to inherit, or what uh, what uh, do you have that we maybe should share with others and is of value for for uh, your communities and other communities? So you you went there and and made a record or, or um, make make made us see that there is something like what was it Ranga? No, I, I don't know the term. Sorry. Uh, so maybe that's very very specific of the of the heritage side of textual heritage and um, yeah also what Isabel for example so uh, that is fantastic to see uh, how this this process of uh, inheriting uh, contents uh, art and poetry uh, so to to um, tell a reader of, of a manga here. This is actually uh, um, a long, long story and connected to so much that could be of your interest. So um, in a way, so even if we probably or only very few of us are able to connect uh, or use uh, um, social media and so, um, but to collaborate or to consider this as an, uh, uh, as an our duty also to uh, disseminate or connect to, to people and make them aware here are things that are in relation to things that you cherish or do or would, which give uh, meaning to your life and your, to, your doing which we I think would, are all able to do because we have chosen to, to deal with things that are of interest for, for us and uh, the, the, the people around us and I think this is something we, we can, can also uh, um, share with others by by using the the, the 
uh, media and ways that are at hand. Oh, it's just a suggestion. In the, into the May group. I ask a question to, to France, but to everybody? Because uh, listening to, to Professor Nelson, may, may I say, Stephen, uh, talk, oh. uh, comment before that I want to hear how this musical score sounded 1,000 years ago. So I have to reconstruct them. And so there is, of course, a part of creativity in this. And of course, nobody will know uh, what, how do, did they, they sound 1,000 years ago. So uh, we lose the sound and we, so we now can reconstruct it and do this creative process. And the question is uh, for, for you, then for you, Franz, that uh, are talking about that every, we can save everything of, of a manuscript or the version. It's not these digital technologies killing the possibility to, to the, 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 or limiting the creativity to reconstruct, to rewrite the past. Don't you think that having everything saved uh, automatically limit our need for, uh, you know, recreate it? That was my thinking. A little bit provocative. <laughs> no, but uh, no, no, so not at all. So I think digitization is only instrumental to achieve exactly what you have in mind. So it's just the mm -hmm. first step. So to not exclude anything by uh, misjudgment or by biased decisions. So to so it's it's more an ideological thing. So to to, to say everything is of value, and I am not the person in charge to to say you survive, you do you do not survive. So as a, as a text, sorry. Uh, and uh, uh, then the next step to, to when we ensure to save or uh, preserve texts, textual heritage, or make them then in a second step to, to, to give more value to this. That's then the, the, the important, the, the difficult task. So the first task is also difficult, okay, yeah. actually difficult and also logistically. There is always something but, yeah, but it's just more a, to it's do. It's a question of ideology. So, so, so to prioritize your steps in order to make sure that you don't do... Um, do any uh, bigger mischief? I mean, we are no. We Thank you. Fail yeah, I got. I, I imagine you. You are. Yeah. Yeah. So. I don't, uh, yeah. Okay, Andrea. I don't know. Maybe we we should. Uh, going. We are. We are five toward... minutes past four p.m. here, but I. Yeah, and did I see that some people? have to leave, start start to uh, need to leave. So should we maybe, maybe I, I can ask if anyone has any final questions, maybe from someone, somebody we haven't heard from until now. I think Maya had a hand up there. Right. Oh, yeah. Yes, please, Maya, can, can you open your mic? No? Okay. First of all, I want to thank all of you, organizers and participants, for wonderful presentations. And I wanted to express my opinion about um, critical edition and uh, digital editions. I think that uh, digital editions can't replace uh, critical editions because we need both of them. But uh, as for digital editions, they are wonderful. Uh, the best thing for scholars, for for example, for textual scholars, for literary scholars, uh, because uh, we have everything at one place and uh, we can, um, uh, uh, instead of going to various archives and various libraries uh, to get some copies of one and the same text, we have everything at one place and uh, it's the best thing for us. <laughs> Thank you, all of you. Thank you. I Thank think you. one, oh, I see one more hand raised, maybe. Yeah. The last comment, yeah. Thank you very much, everyone. Do you hear me? Yes. Uh, thank you very much uh, for a very nice occasion. Um, and then uh, I'm very impressed by every uh, presentation. And then um, 
Um, I'm a, a cultural anthropologist. Probably I am doing very classic type of um, heritage studies, like going to um, the archaeological sites and asking people how they are living together with the archaeological sites and archaeological monuments. So I, I was really um, impressed by uh, every presentation, which is folk, which focus on uh, literatures. And I do read literatures, but I, I usually do not think about the uh, literature very much, text heritage very much. I was always thinking about monumentality and how people are living together with monuments, all that thing. So uh, this was really nice occasion for me to at least think about literature. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so Thank much. You. Thank you. I for think the comment. Um, um, since it seems like it looks like we're getting a few sort of comments to round up things, maybe Eduardo, you have a uh, yes, a little su surprise, so to say. Yes, I, I, I will uh, will throw you this poll uh, just to to get a uh, direct feedback for uh, everyone. Uh, but it's just three questions, so it should be very fast. So uh, how did you feel about this concept of textual heritage? If, if we should go on or, or just quit it? So just be, it, it is anonymous, so you can say, no, it's, I hated it, so that's okay. Andrea, you go. Yeah, I think it would be useful for, for us just to, to have a pulse of how um, everyone liked the event. I actually don't have any, I mean, I have thousands of questions and tens of pages of, of uh, both in digital form and in, uh, and in, in print, but I won't say anything uh, except that I'm very happy to see that I was, I'm per personally out of my comfort zone talking about texts that much since I've been working mostly with people making music, but I bump, I keep bumping into like, like Heidi was saying before, I'm supposed to look at one thing and then text keep coming back. So I thought, I thought it would be a good occasion to actually sort of, um, to see how the, the, to the confine can be somehow broken um, from text to some other means and vice versa to some extent. So personally, I also want to thank all of you for, for staying this long, our keynotes particularly. Um, we. We couldn't hope for better um, shepherds toward, uh, in this, in all of this process. And we didn't really dream of having you for this long. So thank you for your time and your help. And to all of the speakers, thank you so much. The, the diversity and the sheer geographical provenances and geographical topics um, that were covered throughout these three days is I think kind of astonishing. And I'm very happy personally that there was a sense of direction in all of that. Um, and perhaps it was the, the concept of, of move, movement itself that, that gave us that kind of direction. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you so much. We, we've Thank you. tried to keep everything together also time-wise, um, but it is kind of a challenge. And obviously this is a conversation that will keep going on um, in, in what forms we're not sure yet. Certainly one thing we both wanted to mention is we probably will be able to share the recordings from all of the three days with you. Um, so that's one way to go back to, in case you have missed uh, one or more presentations, that's very handy. And we'll be in touch. You can always contact us if you wish to ask any questions or to follow up. Eduardo, would you like to say some final words? Just thank you. Thank you very much. Really, it's been really important to have so many people and so many high level uh, uh, papers and discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you both for organizing. It's been wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great job. Um, Yes. And just a quick question. Is there is there a debriefing with the participants? Is there anything you want to share with us going forward, which might be a good moment now? Catch yes, it, it, it would be a good moment. So if you don't mind staying behind five more minutes only, and maybe we can even launch the, the breakout room 
might be more convenient. Yes, yes maybe. I, I will launch it. So, so I stop the, the, the poll and I stop the registration.